This is Audible. Fighting for Her Bear, Emerald City Shifters, Book Five, written by Kit Tunstall, Kit Fox, narrated by Megan Kelly. Chapter One. Maya Colson moved with the crowd as they poured off the boat, allowing the others to guide her. It was her first time at the event, and she hoped it would be her last. The crowd stopped moving a few hundred feet from the dock, automatically splitting into three lines. She moved into the closest one, trying to see over the people in front of her to determine why they were standing in line. After a twenty-minute wait, she discovered why, when it was her turn. A hulking behemoth of a man stood before her, a turnstile to his left. It was one of three, and they were attached to seriously scary-looking barbed wire-topped fences. He was certainly less than friendly when he eyed her. Betting starts at a thousand bucks, and cash up front. He eyed her closely. You're new. She nodded. This is my first time at the bear fights. Even uttering the words made her feel queasy. He scowled. How did you hear about this? It's discouraged to discuss this among others. Who is your referral? James McCoy, she said quickly. She hoped she remembered his last name, or that he had given her the right last name. He'd sought out the Seattle chapter of Hand and Paw, wanting to report about the bear fights in hopes the group would do something to bring them down. Unfortunately, when the other members discovered the fights were happening on a private island in the San Juan chain, and it required a good outlay of cash to even step onto the island, they had hesitantly decided not to track the tip. Maya was more stubborn, and she was blessed with a healthy bank account, so she had pursued it on her own when no one expressed interest in joining her. The guard, or bookie, grimaced. I hope you're better at paying your debts than McCoy is. She mumbled something as she removed a stack of cash from the pocket of her hoodie. She passed it to him and moved towards the turnstile. He put up a hand blocking her way. She couldn't help noticing his hand was as large as her face. Which bear? Rampage. She picked randomly after glancing at the board posted behind the entrance, each name handwritten in chalk. She had no interest in profiting from these fights. She just wanted to bring them down. The guard inclined his head. You like a sure thing, huh? He made the comment as he passed over a small slip. Don't lose that, or you can't collect your winnings. If I win, she said inanely, assuming it was the sort of conversation he'd expect her to have. He smirked. You bet on Rampage is practically a sure thing. The boss is going to have to mix it up soon, or people will get bored with the same bear always winning. Taking her slip of paper, which she pushed into the pocket of her hoodie, she moved through the turnstile and followed the pathway ahead of her. Her destination was obvious, even though she wasn't moving in tandem with the crowd now. There was a large wooden structure ahead of them, and she moved toward it. Two guards stood on either side of the metal doors that were currently pushed open. She didn't make eye contact as she slipped through the doorway and into the crowd, making sure she had blended in with the others before she took a moment to evaluate the situation. Looking over the throng, Maya quickly ascertained she was one of the few women present. She was certainly the one without a male companion, and none of the other women wore jeans and a hoodie. They were all glammed up in a variety of dresses that could have passed for business casual to a formal event. The few other women all looked bored, and most were hanging from the arm of considerably older men. They looked like they wanted to be anywhere but here. She knew the feeling, but forced herself to remain where she was, off to the side, with a clear view of the arena below. Perhaps ring would have been a better choice of words, she decided, as she looked down over the railing that blocked people from falling into the hole dug into the floor several feet below. It was lined with concrete, and she winced when she saw the bloodstains that probably couldn't be completely removed. It was a utilitarian space, but knowing what it was used for made her stomach churn with nausea. She gripped the rail in front of her for support, remembering abruptly when she was five years old and had stood in a similar position. 
That time, she had ended up okay, though traumatized. She hoped this time she could skip the trauma and emerge from the fighting arena unscathed. Physically, she was in no danger, and she was no longer five years old, so she was smart enough not to climb the railing, but emotionally, she was certain that whatever she witnessed this evening would haunt her forever. It took another twenty minutes for everyone who had been on the boat to pass through security and place their bets, and by the time a whistle sounded, indicating the fight would begin soon, the building was packed. It was too crowded, hot, and noisy, all of which contributed to her nausea. She clung tensely to the rail when another whistle sounded, and two doors in the arena below opened at the same time. At first, no bears emerged, but then two lumbered out, both from different doors. She gasped softly when she saw the two guards behind the larger grayish black bear, both holding cattle prods they used to force the bear to move forward. She wanted to steal the prods and turn them on the guards, but she forced herself to remain still. The little lapel camera she had arranged earlier, which looked like a golden bear pin, was perfectly arranged to get most of the ring below. Maya slipped her hand into her hoodie pocket and pressed a button on the tiny remote in there. She had practiced the move multiple times so her thumb immediately found the round button that began recording. She pushed it as she watched the bears circle each other warily for a moment. Initially, the bears didn't do anything. They just stood there, both looking kind of defeated. It was an odd word, but she couldn't think of a better one to describe the poor sad animals below. They clearly didn't want to be there, and who knew what kind of suffering they had already endured at the hands of the sadistic monsters. The crowd was starting to grumble when the bears didn't fight, and she watched with surprise and a touch of horror when one of the guards came back to the door holding a large barrel rifle. She clamped a hand over her mouth when he lined up a shot, wondering if she was going to see the poor animals murdered for failure to fight. Instead, the guard shot them with something, and she thought it might have been a tranquilizer dart, though that made no sense. A moment later, she discarded that notion when the bear's demeanor changed rapidly. They lost the weary, defeated postures and both became aggressive. The hairs on their backs stood up and their ferocious growls filled the air. She forced herself to stand still and keep recording, but she couldn't look when the bears crashed into each other, standing on their hind paws and swiping at each other with their front paws. There was more growling and a cry of pain, but she didn't open her eyes. Maya endured the horrible sounds for the next few minutes, knowing she needed ample video to turn over to the authorities, but when one let out a low, keening cry that was laced with agony, she shuddered and turned away. With her hand in her pocket, she turned off the camera and slipped through the crowd, intent on getting outside to breathe in fresh air and escape the sounds and sights of the poor bears being forced to fight each other. As she edged around the crowd, she had the sensation of eyes on her. With a frown, she looked around, before looking up as though her gaze had been drawn that way, like by a magnet. She was disconcerted to see another tier above them, and the setup was certainly more elegant than the main audience floor. There were only two people sitting in the box, with guards flanking them from behind, and she guessed they must be the fight organizers. Rage swept through her, but the daunting sight of four guards behind the men kept her from doing anything rash, like confronting them. She quickly realized the one watching her was the younger one. He was probably in his late thirties, and he had dirty blonde hair cropped close to his head, along with a sparse beard that would have looked better if he'd shaved it all off. She couldn't tell his eye color from here, but his gaze was certainly locked on her. She almost shuddered when he sent her a flirtatious smile and waved a hand in her direction. Feigning shyness, she dipped her head and looked away, intent on escaping the structure as quickly as possible. When she stepped outside, the cool breeze from the Strait of Juan del Fuca tickled her hair and caressed her face, the sharp tang of the salt in the sea air helping restore her calm and soothe her nausea. Her mind tried to imagine what was happening in the ring below, but she shut down that thought as soon as it could form. She didn't really want to know. She was aware of the guards watching her, so she stayed in their sight without looking at them as she waited for the fight to end. 
Less than 30 minutes later, the crowd started spilling out, all heading back to the boat. She mingled with them, not breaking away until she was far enough from the structure to feel like the guards wouldn't immediately see her do so. It was a dark night with only a fingernail moon to guide her, but that worked in her favor, even though it slowed her down. Between the lack of moonlight and her dark clothing, she blended in pretty well, she hoped. To be on the safe side, she tightened her hoodie around her head, not wanting any of her blonde hair to escape and be visible in the darkness. She knew she'd have to hurry because the last thing she wanted was to miss the boat and be stuck on this island for two days when the next fights occurred. Still, she couldn't leave without knowing the living conditions of the bears and perhaps finding out how they'd fared physically after the fight. She assumed there were more than two bears being held in captivity, and she briefly entertained the idea of sneaking into their enclosure and freeing them all, and then allowing the bears to run free. Ultimately, she discarded the plan. It wasn't because she worried about innocent people getting hurt. There was no one innocent on the island except for the bears and herself. She was here for a noble purpose, not to see two suffering animals rip each other to shreds and win money on the outcome. She also wasn't eager to be torn apart by the bears, and she couldn't imagine a scenario where she could free them and get clear of their path in time to avoid becoming a casualty. The island was bigger than she had thought upon approaching from the boat, and as she moved past the fighting structure in a wide arc, her eyes widened at the sight of a huge mansion a few hundred yards ahead of her. It was well lit, at least enough to allow her to see the details. The large, off-white structure dominated the area around it, and though she didn't know architecture styles very well, the entire building reminded her of a hacienda one might see in Texas as a holdover from the pre-Civil War days, or in Central or South America. It was an incongruous sight on an island near Seattle, but she didn't have time to indulge her curiosity. She wasn't approaching the house anyway. It was clearly a private residence and likely belonged to the two horrible people she'd seen in the private box, the architects of the suffering of the bears on this island. With that reminder, she turned away from the huge house and moved deeper into the island. She could feel the seconds ticking past in a desperate rhythm, certain she was running out of time to make it back to the boat. Even knowing that, she couldn't force herself to turn around and head back that way. Not yet. She heard the bear enclosure before she saw it. She could hear the moans of anguish and the occasional growling sound. She was startled by how human the bear sounded, which made her even angrier that they were being exploited this way. They were sensitive, intelligent creatures, and to know they were being forced to fight each other for sick people's amusement sent rage spiraling through her. She took several deep breaths in an attempt to keep it in check as she eased closer to the enclosure. She was just in time to see the man who had given her a flirtatious grin step into sight. She counted at least five cages holding bears, though only two of them were occupied at the moment. She immediately recognized the big gray black bear from the fight, along with his slightly smaller companion, who was a golden brown color. They both laid in their cages, looking exhausted and defeated, again. In shock, she watched as the man wielded a rifle similar to the one the guard had used to shoot the bears at the beginning of the fight. She was still trying to process why they would need to do that, assuming it was some sort of tranquilizer, as the bears seemed to melt in front of her. She let out a small gasp before clapping a hand over her mouth to keep in further unwanted sounds, trying to figure out what she was seeing. Her thumb automatically hit the record button on the remote, even as her mind struggled to process the transformation of bears to human men. She shook her head, disbelief coursing through her. She certainly couldn't have seen what she thought she had. Could she? But how could she doubt the evidence before her? The bears were gone, replaced by two lethargic men who lay in their cages. The closest one to her had a perfect physique, with thick muscles, a lean waist, and clearly defined abdominal muscles. He was rough, smeared with blood, and covered with dirt, and his black hair was overgrown and shaggy, but in the lighting provided from the lamps overhead, secured to posts, she saw it was still a thick mass of ebony. When he was cleaned up, his hair no doubt shone with a hint of blue in the black. 
Right now, it was matted and filthy, and there was no shine anywhere. Pity swept through her, and though she wasn't certain what was happening, she still couldn't stand by and watch it. She was considering moving forward and knocking out the guy with the gun somehow so she could free the humans when a hand fell on her shoulder. She froze, letting out a small cry of dismay as she turned to look up at the guard who had taken her bet. She tried to force a shaky smile, but she was certain all she did was grimace at him as fear and anger warred for supremacy. Move, he said in more of a grunt than a word. His hand remained clamped on her shoulder as he shoved her forward, her petite curvy frame no match for his larger, harder body. Fear consumed her, and it was difficult to breathe, so she forced herself to focus on doing so, slightly controlling her anger and terror by slowing down her breathing. Her breathing exercises did little to keep her calm when the security guard pushed her into the other man's line of sight. Her stomach clenched with dread when she saw the male interest in his eyes, indicating he wanted her. That was the last thing she wanted, but she struggled to hide her revulsion at his flirtatious smirk. What's this? He asked the guard, though he didn't look away from her. She was snooping out there in the shadows, and you know Signor Calderon's rule. If they see something, the gamblers don't leave the island. A chill ran through her at the words, though she was unsurprised by that rule. Common sense dictated it would have to exist, because he wouldn't want word of his illegal bear-fighting enterprise to leak out. A quick glance at the two men in the cages reminded her that there was something far more sinister at work here than simply forcing two bears to fight each other. That was bad enough, but she couldn't fathom the depths of depravity occurring on this island. What are you doing snooping out here, young lady? The man with the rifle asked the question sternly, but there was a disquieting hunger in his gaze as it slipped over her, taking in her appearance from head to toe. Were you looking for me? Briefly, she considered playing into that notion, but realized it could quickly escalate out of control. She had a feeling flirting with this man would be even worse than admitting the full truth of why she was here. The slightest sign of encouragement on her part would probably set in motion a series of events she couldn't and didn't want to face. Instead, she cleared her throat. I'm sorry. I was just curious about the bears. I wanted to know what happened to them after the fight. He was still leering at her, but the hint of wariness had faded. You seem like a tender little thing, having to leave the fight at the midway point. His brown eyes narrowed slightly. Which begs the question, why you come somewhere like this to start with? I was curious. It was a lame excuse, but she hoped he'd buy it. He seemed to want to, so she forced herself to give him a smile while she fluttered her eyelashes at him. It's one of my biggest flaws. I just want to know everything. How did you end up on our island? The guard behind her spoke up for the first time since he'd explained why he brought her to the other man. James McCoy referred her. The man grimaced. I hope you aren't as unreliable as your friend. He still owes Signor Calderon quite a bundle. She shook her head, quickly realizing why James had brought the bear fighting ring to hand and paw's attention. It had nothing to do with concern for the bear's welfare. He was simply hoping they would gather enough intel to interest the authorities and spur them to act. He probably thought their group would be the catalyst to bring down the people on this island, thereby negating his debt. She had previously admired him for speaking up about the problem, and she believed him when he'd said he had stumbled onto the situation while going with a friend to what he thought was going to be a regular underground fight between two willing participants. Now, she quickly lost any hint of admiration for the other man. He's not a friend. He's someone I met once or twice, that's all. So he isn't your boyfriend? asked the other man. She was disturbed by the gleam of interest, and she quickly shook her head. She didn't want to dwell on anything that reminded the guy of dating or sex. Who are you? she asked, trying to change the subject quickly. I'm Dr. Elgin Stone, but I think that question belongs to me. Who are you? Maya Cole. She broke off quickly, realizing she shouldn't give him a real name. Too bad she hadn't had that epiphany before she started speaking hers out of habit. 
At least she hadn't given him her full name, though it would be easily discovered if they bothered to investigate her. She had left her identity behind at the university, but she had her phone on her, so she doubted they'd have much trouble figuring out who she was if they took her things. Maya, I'm afraid this may be a situation where curiosity killed the cat. He sounded regretful, even as he leered at her breasts, though he clearly couldn't have seen much of anything through the oversized hoodie. She gulped, trying to clear the lump in her throat. You're going to kill me? She tried to go for a disbelieving, almost girlish tone, but she was certain it fell flat. She just couldn't seem to force herself to flirt with the creepy man in front of her, especially when he was talking about murdering her. He shook his head. That isn't my call, sweetheart. If it were, I'm certain we could find other uses for you. That's up to Signor Calderon, though. He owns the island, and he's the one who makes the final decisions on what to do with people like you. She arched a brow. People like me? She repeated, her lips numb as the implications of being discovered started to sink in. Up until that point, she'd been optimistic she could talk her way out of this simply by building on the attraction the doctor had for her. Knowing there was another person entering the equation had robbed her of any confidence. Her gaze started around, and she saw the man in the cage behind Stone. He looked bewildered and clearly drugged, but when their gazes met, his eyes widened and his nostrils flared. He jerked upright for just a moment, growling something incomprehensible, though he was in his human form. Those words reverberated inside her skull, sounding too fantastical to believe. Even though she had seen the transition with her own eyes, she was still half hoping for a different explanation, one that was reasonable and didn't involve the reality of a bear turning into a human. Take her to Signor Calderon, said the doctor, his regret visible. Her fearful gaze hadn't moved from the humans, and he growled again, clearly making an effort to get to his feet. She had the strangest certainty he was trying to intercede to save her, but the poor man was clearly in no condition to do so. Whatever they had pumped into him had left him incapacitated and drugged. Pity swelled in her, but she forced it back. It was a non-productive emotion, and if she was going to pity anyone, she should probably pity herself. Her odds of outliving the man in the cage behind her seemed fairly grim. Chapter 2 Maya didn't try to fight the security goon or stone, figuring there was no point in doing so. She was truly at their mercy, at least until she saw an opening to escape, if one presented itself. As she walked in front of the guard with stone on her right, she looked at him. Why are they so drugged? His eyes gleamed with excitement and also a touch of confusion. I'm still experimenting with the proper amount of inhibitor, and it makes all our lives easier if they are kept on the docile side when they are being prepped for and recovering from a fight. She shuddered slightly, the casual spoken words making her ill. What do you do to prepare them for the fight? He hesitated, looking torn. I probably shouldn't tell you. Trying to be pragmatic while digging for information, she said. Who am I going to tell? I doubt this Signor Calderon will let me off the island. Her heart sank when he nodded, though she hadn't exactly been hoping for confirmation. It was obvious the doctor wanted to talk about his experiments, so he allowed himself to be indiscreet to her gain. When I first began the experiment, I had to isolate the gene responsible for their shifting ability. Once I had that, which took several months of research, I had to figure out a chemical stimulator that would force the shifter to transform. It's the same chemical, and it can be used as a stop or start agent. She nodded, thinking she was understanding. So you found a way to turn off and on their shifter gene? He shook his head, looking impatient. No, not at all. It's always on. It's part of their genetic code. I just found a way to control the shift, which is normally at a shifter's discretion. Signor Calderon's venture here wouldn't work unless we could control when they shifted. 
She gritted her teeth, trying not to argue with him, because she genuinely wanted to know everything she could about the setup on the off chance she could escape and bring help to the island. Not that she thought the authorities would believe her if she told him a group of bad people were keeping another group of humans who could shift into bears as prisoners. That was sure to go over well, and maybe they'd listen right after her psych evaluation. Okay, I think I understand that process, but why are they so drugged now? He looked pleased that she had grasped what he was telling her. Just forcing them to transform wasn't enough, you see. From what I can tell, they still retain their full intellect and range of emotion during transformation. We could force them to transform, but we couldn't make them fight. He sighed, sounding disgusted with the lot of them, as though they had personally colluded to thwart him. Fortunately, we got around that by developing an aggression stimulator. It ramps up their adrenals and their anger to the point where they can't avoid fighting. Pure instinct takes over. It would happen to real humans, too. Give him or her a dose of the stimulant, and they'd be crazier than someone on PCP, and stronger, too. Not because the stimulator makes you stronger, but it dulls your sense of pain, so you don't feel your muscles tearing until later, for example. She exhaled raggedly, her concern and pity for the people in the cages increasing even more. So you took away their ability to choose when to shift, and then you took away their ability to choose not to fight? I can see why you have to keep them drugged all the time. They'd probably rip you apart if they got the chance. He blinked, looking as though he had never considered that idea before. Then he shrugged. I suppose, but I'm not worried. We have excellent security here on the island. We don't keep them drugged to keep them docile, at least not completely. After a fight, their aggression levels are still ramped up, so we have to administer an inhibitor as soon as possible to return them to a more relaxed state. Unfortunately, I'm still trying to calculate the right amount to stop the aggression in the shifter form without decimating the human side and leaving the subject exhausted without decimating the human side and leaving the subject exhausted and insensate for hours after the inhibitor is administered. People she said through gritted teeth. He blinked. People what? It was difficult not to stop and slap him, but she somehow reined in the impulse. You called them subjects. I was just reminding you, they're people. He chuckled, sounding indulgent when he replied. They're sort of people. So fascinating, and there's much I can learn from them, but they aren't really humans. I'd prefer to keep this purely scientific for the experiments, but every scientist needs funding. Signor Calderon comes with a few stipulations that I might not like, but I'll do what I must for the research. She rolled her eyes, not bothering to argue with the arrogant jerk. He was never going to see the people in the cages as his equals, though in her opinion, they were likely superior. She hadn't yet really interacted with any of them, but they had to be forced to fight one another. She could easily imagine the scientist beside her not having to be drugged to fight. He seemed like the type who would gladly tear apart his own species just to get ahead. He certainly had no hesitation about doing it to another, if they were a separate species. Surely the shifters must be, though she didn't quite understand how any of it worked. She remembered he had mentioned something about a gene that controlled shifting, which suggested they were simply a different species, but there was no way to know without asking him. They had reached the big house now, and she was certain her time for asking had run out anyway. She took a deep breath as she braced herself to walk in with the guard and the scientist, wondering what kind of monster waited for her on the other side of the door. Judging from what he had created here, his own little private island along the lines of Dr. Moreau, she was imagining a hideously deformed man. Less than a minute later, after the guard had escorted her into a room on the first floor that appeared to be a library, she realized her mental imaging was way off. Signor Calderon sat in a wing-back chair, a thick book on his lap, and he waved to the other chair beside him, sitting at an angle. He was probably in his mid to late fifties, but his dark hair was still mostly black, threaded only with the occasional shots of silver. 
His coppery brown skin was lined, and it made him look distinguished. He had finely drawn features, and he was still handsome despite his age. As she took the seat he indicated, her stomach clenching, she met his eyes, and that's where she saw the monster who hid behind the veneer. Perhaps he made no effort to project any sort of life into those eyes, or perhaps he'd fooled himself into believing he had masked his inhumanity behind an urbane exterior, but looking into his lifeless cold eyes, she was certain he was a man without conscience. She would have believed that anyway, based solely on what she'd seen thus far, but looking into his gaze, she knew with absolute certainty that he was the most dangerous creature on this island. Elgin tells me you are snooping around our little operation, senorita. Or is it senora? Senorita, she said, feeling ridiculous doing so. Who cared about her marital status at the moment? I'm sorry, I was just curious about everything. How is it you found your way to our island to start with, senorita? She licked her lips, trying to control her nerves. I heard about this place from James McCoy, and I didn't really believe there were bear fights. I wanted to see it for myself, and then after I saw enough to know they were real, I wanted to see the bears closer. I didn't mean to learn something I wasn't supposed to know. He leaned forward slightly, lifting a glass bottle of clear liquid and pouring some into a tumbler. He looked in her direction and arched a brow. Would you like a tequila? She shook her head. There was no way she could swallow anything past the huge lump in her throat. He didn't argue with her or try to persuade her to change her mind. He simply lifted his drink and sipped slowly for a moment as he stared across the room at her. You've put me in a difficult position, senorita. I don't want to kill you, because killing women is bad karma. But I can't have you running around telling everyone what you've seen here. She shook her head, trying to look earnest. I wouldn't. He laughed, an edge of mocking to it. Of course you would. You might think you wouldn't, but you would tell someone, and they'd tell someone, and sometime, at some point, someone would believe you. She waved a hand. Who is going to believe any of this? He let out a regretful sigh. I wish I could believe you, but I can't. I can't risk my empire coming under scrutiny. And I'm sure the shifters themselves don't want the world at large to know about them. She almost snorted aloud at the thought, as though he really expected her to believe he was doing anything to protect shifter community. His actions were designed to benefit only himself. I really don't want to die, Signor Calderon. It was simple curiosity. He inclined his head. If I don't kill you, what should I do with you? It was clearly a rhetorical question to which he expected no answer. Her brain summoned a response all the same, considering it a stroke of genius. I'm in the veterinary sciences program at the University of Washington. I still have a couple of more years until I'm a vet, but I know enough to help take care of the animals. She stumbled on the last word slightly, having a difficult time calling the people in cages animals, as though they weren't worthy of protection or equal status. Unfortunately, animals often received unequal treatment, so in a sense, she wasn't insulting the shifters. She was expressing her wish that things were different. He seemed skeptical for a moment. I am not certain doctor requires any assistance. A chill crept up her spine when Elgin stepped forward eagerly, putting a hand on her shoulder in a possessive way that made her skin crawl. I am certain I can find a position for her, senor. It seems like an ideal solution to me. For a second, she considered asking for death instead of being left at Stone's mercy, but she didn't really mean that. She was afraid Signor Calderon would grant that request if it was made. She'd have to find a way to deal with Stone and try to stay out of his way and out of his reach, but if he could persuade the older man to let her stay, at least she'd be alive to fight another day. He appeared to ponder for a moment before issuing a single nod. I see no reason why we can't try. Just as long as you understand, you are disposable at any moment, senorita. What is your name? Maya Cole. 
As she had done before, she cut off the suffix of her name, hating to share even that much, but having already done so previously without thinking. He nodded. If you step out of line or you try to leave without permission, I'll have my men deal with you, and then I'll chop you up and feed you to the bears as bait. She didn't bother to ask as bait for what, assuming it had something to do with riling them up before making them fight each other after administering the stimulator. Instead, she tried to appear simpering and grateful. I appreciate it, senor, and I'll try not to let you down. He shrugged. It doesn't matter if you let me down. I never expect people to live up to my expectations anyway, unless they are negative expectations. Calderon shrugged again. I fully expect to put a bullet in your brain before the end of the month. I doubt you'll settle in and take to the way of life we have here, but it costs me nothing to be generous enough to allow you to prove me wrong. She nodded, trying to maintain a pleasant smile, even as she dug her fingernails into the lustrous fabric upholstery on the wooden arm of the chair where she sat. She didn't speak again, and he didn't seem to care. He just waved them away. As they reached the doorway, he called out to the guard. Give her a room in the servants' quarters, Guillermo. With a sharp nod, the guard tightened his fingers on her arm, though it was hardly necessary since he was already holding her in a vice-like grip, and turned to the left, opposite the direction they had entered, clearly intent on showing her where she'd be staying. She dared to let out a shaky sigh of relief as he moved away from the library and Signor Calderon. She let out another sigh of relief when the doctor parted from them, giving her a lusty glance that made her blood run icy cold. He was clearly going to be a problem. The guard Calderon had identified as Guillermo took her down a flight of stairs, apparently into what would be considered the basement of a normal house. She wasn't certain what they called it in a mansion, besides the servants' quarters. Guillermo seemed to know right where they were going, because he led her to a door at the end of the hallway with the number eight on it. He pushed it open without knocking and turned on the light, revealing a tiny bedroom with two twin beds shoved against the corners and a common nightstand between them. There was an even smaller cubicle that was supposed to be the closet, and she saw a few articles of clothing hanging there. Who's my roommate? It could either be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on where the loyalties of her roommate lay. No roommate! The last maid displeased Signor Calderon! He made a gesture by pulling his finger across his throat. She was let go without a severance package, he said with a slight twist of his lips, as though it was a humorous situation. His smile fled a moment later. Hand over your phone. Maya thought about arguing, but realized there was no point. At least he hadn't asked her to empty her pockets, because the remote would no doubt spurn questions she didn't want to answer. With a disgruntled sound, she handed over her iPhone. A squeak of outrage escaped her when he brought his large foot down on the sleek device, pulverizing it with one blow. You didn't have to do that. He shrugged. Make yourself at home, he said mockingly. She nodded, feeling vaguely faint when she collapsed onto the bed nearest her. I don't have any clothes or anything. He waved to the closet. You can use what Maria left behind. She won't be needing them. With another chuckle and a gleam of pride in his eyes that made her question whether he was the one who had been tasked with taking care of her resignation, he left the room, closing the door securely behind him. She waited a few minutes before summoning the courage to approach the door. She held her breath as she turned the knob, half expecting to have been locked in. It was a bit of a surprise to discover the knob turned easily in her hand and the door opened with a small squeak of the hinges. After closing it and locking it from the inside, through a flimsy bolt was more an illusion of privacy than anything, she rushed back to the bed and lifted the mattress, putting the pin, or camera, and its remote underneath the thin mattress. Then she collapsed onto the bed again, almost certain she could feel the telltale lump of where she'd hidden the device, though that was surely paranoia. She hadn't been confined to her room, but it seemed like a small victory. They had security crawling the island, along with guns, and probably even more massive firepower than she had seen secured somewhere on the estate. 
She thought she had heard the barking of dogs, too, so they might have canines they used to track people. Getting off the island would be a difficult task. She refused to consider it impossible, because that would be akin to giving up and either accepting the bullet Calderon planned on giving her if she didn't comply, or being complicit in the subjugation of the bear shifters held as the other man's prisoner. Neither alternative was something she was willing to accept. Chapter 3 no one woke her, and when she made her way to the kitchen after a quick wash in the tiny bathroom next to her room, one that shared a connecting door with another room she suspected was equally tiny, and helping herself to some of Maria's clothing, which was a little snug, but would do, she enjoyed a quick but hearty breakfast the housekeeper served her with a smile. It was a bit like being on vacation, if she ignored the dire peril and the moral atrocities occurring on the island. Even the tastiest tortilla and freshest migas couldn't allow her to do that. After eating, she moved from the kitchen, following the housekeeper's directions on how to exit from the servants' quarters and making her way toward the enclosure where they kept the shifters. It didn't take long to reach it, and she entered the building, realizing there were no cages outside today. She eyed the nearest one as she stepped into the cool, darkened interior, though it wasn't so dark she couldn't see. She was able to see the wheels on the concrete and steel cages now that she had a moment to observe them, and fortunately, the one she was studying was empty. She inferred they moved the cages in and out of the enclosure as the shifters were forced to fight, reducing the distance required to transport the shifters without some sort of protection or imprisonment. Slowly, she let her gaze move around the room, wincing when she realized there were at least twenty cages, though only five appeared to house prisoners at the moment. Of the five, only one was female, and she was in a deep sleep. The others were in varying states of semi-consciousness, and she approached the nearest one. He was a paunchy man in his mid-forties, and normally she would have been discomfited, if not outright embarrassed by his nudity, but his suffering overpowered any other reactions or observations. Her heart stuttered, and there was a pang in her chest when she looked at his sad state. He had probably once been far more robust, and even with a slight beer gut, she could see his ribs higher up. She met his gaze, unsurprised to find him staring vacantly at her, without any signs of cognition that she recognized. Hello, she said softly. My name is Maya, and I'm here to help you. A snort to her left caught her attention, and she moved carefully toward the occupant, eyes widening when she recognized him as the shifter who had fought last night, the one who had met her gaze and growled at her, or perhaps he had been growling at stone. Either way, she remembered him being grumpy, though she couldn't fault him under the circumstances. I'm Maya, and I'm here to... Help, he said in a mocking fashion. Of course you are. His words were slightly slurred, but he was the most alert of the five, despite a slight sense of haziness in his expression and the droopy set of his eyelids. She bit her lip. I really do want to help you guys. I didn't know about any of this until last night, but I'm trying to think of a way to get you all out of here. The walls have ears. For a moment, she thought he was hallucinating, but then she realized he was warning her about a surveillance system. They're recording everything I say? He stared at her for a moment, the faintest hint of amusement in his eyes, as though he'd forgotten how to feel the emotion and was uncertain how to identify it. No. Not as far as I know. I was just kidding. She let out an exasperated sigh. Believe what you wish, Mr. I don't know your name or what to call you, but I'm stuck here because I was trying to help. I'm still trying to help, but I might only be able to get myself off the island and then send back help. An overly long strand of black hair flopped onto his forehead and into his eyes when he shook his head. It was unclear if he was disagreeing with her, or perhaps trying to restore some of his awareness and shake off the drug-induced stupor. No one would believe you if you told them what you saw here. If they did, they'd be no help getting the shifters freed from Calderon. If you really want to help, why don't you call Javier and tell him this is where he'll find his little brother, the traitor? What do you mean? Javier who? Calderon, he said and shook his head again. 
A moment later, he slumped against the bars of the cage. Cartel. She tried pressing for more answers, but he fell back into a restless sleep. She moved around the cages, but none of the five were capable of engaging in any real conversation. They all had injuries, and she set out to look for medical supplies to treat what she could. She was training to be an animal doctor, not a people doctor, but a lot of the physiology would be the same, and most of the treatment techniques would be interchangeable. In a way, it seemed futile to patch them up just to send them back into the fighting ring, but she couldn't allow them to keep suffering if she could do something to help, even if it was something minute and temporary. In search of medical supplies, she left the communal room that served as the prison area for the shifters, soon entering far more complexly outfitted rooms. These all had clear medical or scientific purposes, and she assumed she had stumbled onto Elgin's research lab. It made sense that he would be close to the shifters, and she hoped being at least somewhat of a medical facility, she'd be able to find medical supplies. The best she could do was a large first aid kit on the wall, which she removed from the mounting bracket and lugged the heavy case back to the room housing the bears. Equipped as well as she could be under the circumstances, she knew it was time for the hard part as she approached the first cage. She was actually relieved it wasn't the bear shifter who had spoken to her only a few minutes ago. This was a young, clearly healthy man, though he was drugged just like the others. The next problem she encountered was being able to reach the wounds. With the shifters so out of it, they couldn't help her by repositioning closer to the bars. She bit her lip indecisively for a long moment before accepting the only alternative to walking away, which was entering the cage with them. She didn't find the prospect all that frightening, especially since they were all in a drugged stupor. She looked at the latch on the cage, unsurprised to find a big lock for which she had no key. I'll be right back, she whispered to the man she had planned to take care of first, leaving the first aid kit on the floor before exiting the enclosure in search of a guard. She didn't have to go far before she encountered Guillermo, and she briefly wondered if he had been assigned to follow her at a distance, but quickly discarded the idea. If he had been assigned as her shadow, they wouldn't have bothered with discretion. It would have been blatantly obvious to her that she was being monitored. I need you to let me into the cages, please. He arched a shaggy brown brow. Are you insane? She bit back a sigh of impatience. I can't reach their wounds outside of the cage, and they're in no shape to help me. I'm in no danger. He shook his head. It's a bad idea. She propped her hands on her hips and faced off with him, trying to ignore the disparity in their height and weight. What difference does it make? They're in no condition to escape, and if one of them happens to kill me, it's not a big deal, at least to you. Calderon already said he'll probably shoot me by the end of the week anyway. This saves him the cost of a bullet. Guillermo surprised her by laughing. You have cojones, senorita. Lead the way. She spun on her heel and returned to the shifters in the enclosure, standing back so Guillermo could open the first cage. She grimaced when she saw he had made a stop somewhere to procure a long cattle prod. That won't be necessary, he shrugged. We'll see. Deciding there was no point in arguing with him, she grasped the first aid kit and stepped into the cage, bending down to fit through the doorway. It was an ominous feeling when Guillermo closed the cage door behind her and the lock clicked in place a moment later. She was locked in with the bear shifter, but rather than feeling fear, all she felt was an overwhelming sense of sympathy when she saw the marks on his body and the way he barely even turned his head when she spoke to him. She kept up a steady stream of smoothing talk as she cleaned his wounds, but he never really roused enough to be aware of what was happening. He had a gash deep enough on his thigh to require stitches, but that was beyond the capacity of the first aid kit. Do you have a needle and thread, medical grade, of course? She asked the guard. Guillermo snorted. Make do with what you have. She muttered under her breath while she took a handful of steri strips, using them to carefully close the wound as best she could. When she was finished, she looked up at the guard again. You can let me out now. He flashed her a wicked grin, holding up the keys in a teasing fashion. Perhaps I could leave you in there until the next fight and they'd change him. 
That could get interesting. She kept her gaze impassive and hid any response to his taunting. I have others to see, too, she said in a low, even tone. With a sigh of displeasure, as though she had disappointed him by her lack of response, he unlocked the cage, allowing her to exit before locking it again. She deliberately saved the shifter with the dark hair for last, because he was the most aware and the most likely to resist any help. He was lying still when Guillermo unlocked his cage, and she took a deep breath before stepping inside, waiting for the click of the lock before kneeling down beside him. The urge to touch him in a non-medical way washed over her, and she clenched her fists to avoid running her fingers down the hard, sculpted planes of his body. It was a strange reaction, and she hadn't experienced anything like it with the other three male shifters, though they all had impressive physiques. There was just something about this man that made her want to caress him, so she cleared her throat, attempting to get his permission before she did anything, especially something so violating as to fondle him while he was unconscious. I'm here to help you. His eyes snapped open, and there was more awareness than there had been. She suspected he had been playing possum for Guillermo's benefit, and she half expected him to lunge at her and pin her to the bars. She held her breath as she waited to see what he would do. I don't want your help. That wound on your stomach looks terrible. At least let me clean it, please? He glared at her. No help. He bared his teeth at her in an aggressive fashion as he sat up with more speed than she would have expected in his current stupor. He lifted a hand, and she was certain it was simply to ward her off, but Guillermo must have taken it as a more threatening gesture, or perhaps he was just looking for an excuse to use the cattle prod. Whatever it was, he touched it to the shifter's thigh, laughing when the man in front of her twitched under the force of the voltage. Stop it! You're going to kill him! With a small sigh of regret, Guillermo removed the cattle prod from the cage, shaking his head. A little shock won't kill him, not with those shifter genes. He turned his attention to the bear shifter, his voice getting firmer. Let her help you, Rampage. At the sound of that name, she realized he was definitely one of the bears who had been fighting the previous night. She was certain he was the gray-black bear, and that confirmed it. It also explained why his wounds were fresher than some of the others. She touched him carefully, checking for a pulse and relieved to find it beating steadily and strong underneath her fingertips. The shock hadn't appeared to do permanent damage, though she had been concerned since he was already in a weakened state. She kept her touch and her voice gentle when she spoke to him. I really do want to help you. Please let me. He glared at Guillermo but didn't reply. He simply lay still as she examined him obstensively for broken bones, though she couldn't deny to herself that there was certainly an element of curiosity that had nothing to do with treatment in her exploration. After determining he had no broken bones, she set to cleaning the wound on his stomach. He endured it stoically, never looking at her. After bandaging it, she asked him to turn onto his stomach, and he glared at her as he did so with clear reluctance. She let out a harsh gasp when she saw his back, which was bruised and bloodied, with several long gashes that had probably been inflicted by his opponent. I think you need stitches, but I don't have the supplies to do that. He just grunted, either in too much pain to speak or simply uninterested in conversation with her. She bit her lip as she opened the bottle of antiseptic, uncertain if it would hurt. It wasn't supposed to, but these were deep wounds. She spread it over the gashes, and the way he stiffened and twitched suggested it was hurting him. She put a hand on his shoulder, squeezing gently. I'll try to be gentle, but it's going to hurt. It was the gentle touch of her hand and voice that seemed to trigger him, rather than the pain from his wound. He shrugged her off forcefully, sending her colliding with the bars. She let out a small moan as she hit the metal, realizing simultaneously that Guillermo was bringing up the cattle prod again. Acting on instinct rather than common sense, she pushed herself between the cattle prod and the shifter, not wanting him to be shocked again. No, she said just as the prongs touched her skin. A fiery pain like she'd never known radiated through her, and she twitched under the force of it. 
Fortunately, Guillermo pulled back almost as soon as he touched her, but it was still a strong jolt of electricity, and she collapsed to the floor of the cage. She was unaware of events transpiring for a moment, and when she came back to herself, she realized the bear shifter was holding her, though he seemed unhappy about the idea. I'm sorry, she said softly, her voice sounding raspy. He frowned down at her. Why are you sorry? Are you sorry for being a fool and getting in the path of the cattle prod? It could have killed you. She bit her lip. I didn't want you to be shocked again. There was no reason for it foolish. The word was cruel, but there was a surprising hint of tenderness underneath it. Can you move now, human? She stretched and slowly sat up, feeling an occasional spasm jerk through her muscles, but otherwise unscathed. I'll be fine. Let me finish your back. He let out a long-suffering sigh. Very well. She hurried through cleaning it, suddenly anxious to escape the man before her. She didn't think he would hurt her, but she needed space to deal with how she was feeling and process what had happened. She was a confusing jumble of emotions, and combined with the shock of the cattle prod, it was no wonder she needed some time to herself to regain composure and perspective. It was a relief to exit the cage, and she didn't look at the shifter before she left. She didn't even take the first aid kit. As soon as her feet touched the cement, she rushed from the enclosure and out into the open air, struggling to hide how shaken she was, and wasn't even entirely sure why she was such a mess. It had surprisingly little to do with being shocked by the cattle prod, and was almost exclusively because of the man she had just taken care of, despite his reluctance. The next morning, Mile was mildly surprised to find all of the bears more aware, and they were also surprisingly compliant when she checked their wounds. Once again, she saved Rampage for last, feeling a bout of nerves as Guillermo unlocked the cage for her that she hadn't experienced when entering the other's enclosures. She took a deep breath and stepped inside, meeting his gaze. He seemed to have most of his faculties today, and she wondered if it was because there hadn't been a fight last night, or if someone had missed a dose on their drugs. It was a disconcerting thought, because she doubted they would be that careless. More likely, if someone had skipped dosing the shifters, it had been Stone, and he wanted to observe their interactions with her when they weren't quite so incapacitated. He was probably watching them, or at least recording the treatment to study later. She tried to push aside the thought and focus on the man in front of her. Good morning, Rampage. He stiffened and growled at her. That isn't my name. That's the name these fuckers gave me. Don't use it. She held up her hands in a gesture of surrender. I'm sorry. I thought it was your name. What should I call you? Hail, he said eventually, seeming reluctant to part with his name. Good morning, Hale, she said, trying again. I need to look at your wounds. He glared at her. I don't know why you bother, since they are just going to get opened again in the ring. She nodded, not bothering to refute his words. Maybe I can take away some of the pain in the interim. She worked in silence for a few moments, until she had him turn to reveal his back. When she removed the bandages, she let out a small breath of surprise. You've really healed. Not completely, but this looks much better than it did yesterday. He nodded abruptly. Shifters heal rapidly. If I could transform naturally, it would heal during the transformation process. Whatever crap they put in us interferes with the healing mechanism, though, so we are left with slowly healing wounds, though I guess it's still faster than the average Homo sapiens. Are we a different species, then? She carefully dabbed at the wounds with antiseptic and fresh gauze as she spoke. He nodded. We're Ursa sapiens, and you're Homo sapiens. A surge of excitement filled her, and it had nothing to do with being this close to him. It was sparked purely by her thirst for knowledge in her chosen field. I'm a veterinarian student. I'm not a vet yet, but I will be in a couple of years. I'm hoping to work with wildlife, especially bears. I'd like to see as many remain in the wild as possible. Why bears? She didn't speak for a moment as she finished fastening the bandages and taping them down. When I was five, my parents took me to a zoo, and I was an idiot. I climbed on top of the bars to get a better look at the baby bear cubs in the enclosure below. 
Before my dad could catch me, I slipped forward and fell in. I don't remember much about the experience because I had head trauma. I just remember the mother bear holding me in her lap, and I felt safe. I know from my parents telling me the details that she found me right after I fell, and rather than hurt me, she seemed to realize I was just a little one like her babies, so she picked me up and rocked me on her lap. The officials at the zoo had to sedate her so they could get me, since she was determined not to let them rescue me. I imagine she thought they would hurt me. Whatever her thought processes, she took care of me, and I've been fascinated with bears ever since. He turned on to his side to look at her. Working for those bloodthirsty bastards must be a dream come true, then. She stiffened at the condemnation in his voice. I'm not here voluntarily, either, Hale. Lowering her voice in case they were being recorded, she bent over him, ostensibly to look at his shoulder, but really so she could bring her mouth closer to his ear. I'm a member of Hand and Paw, which is an animal rights organization. I was here undercover to investigate the bear fights when I discovered that there was something even worse going on. They caught me, and it's either work with them while taking care of the fighters or end up dead. I'm as much a prisoner here as you are. His gaze locked with hers. There was a flash of heat that quickly dissipated, and his expression cooled. Yet I'm the one in the cage. With a small sigh, she leaned back from him and sat her bottom on her calves, regarding him solemnly. I'll probably end up dying here, but if there's any way at all to escape, I'm going to try to rescue all of you. She kept her voice soft, hoping he might have exceptional hearing to go with his other amazing abilities. She raised her voice a little bit more after speaking to him. You seem to be doing well and healing rapidly. The wounds probably will be gone by tomorrow. He snorted. Only to be replaced by new ones, little vet. I have a name, too, she said. It's Maya Cole. She forced herself to truncate the last part of her name. You can call me Maya. Well, Maya, all your hard work will be undone tonight. She frowned at him. What do you mean? His lips compressed into a grim line. It's fight night. A chill ran through her at the words, and she wanted to protest that he surely wouldn't be forced to fight again already, but he knew far more about this horrible situation than she did. All she could do was place a comforting hand on his thigh, trying to communicate without words how concerned she was for him. She was concerned for all of them, but she couldn't deny she had a deeper connection with Hale than she did with any of the others. She couldn't explain it, either. Chapter 4 Maya was dismayed when Elgin cornered her in the kitchen just after she had finished eating with the other staff. She forced herself not to betray her disgust when he put a hand on her arm. Hello? She said in a cold tone, unable to pretend any warmth. He appeared oblivious. Apparently I'm not just the scientist around here. I'm also the delivery boy. He looked like he wanted to pout for a minute. She frowned her confusion. What does that mean? Signor Calderon has invited you to share his box for tonight's fight. She grimaced, unable to hide her disgust that time. No, thank you. I have no interest in watching that spectacle again. His hand tightened around her forearm, and he tugged her forward. One does not refuse Signor Calderon's invitations, not if you want to see tomorrow. With a sigh, she stopped resisting and fell into line beside Elgin. He tried holding her arm despite her cooperation, and she jerked it away forcefully. I can walk on my own, thanks. He scowled at her. If it weren't for me, you wouldn't still be alive. A little gratitude wouldn't be out of bounds, Maya. But unrequested touching is. Thank you for speaking up on my behalf, but I hope it wasn't because you expect something more tangible in return than help with the shifters. He laughed softly. I expect all kinds of things, and I'll collect as opportunities arise. She trembled, but struggled to suppress the reaction. It would only encourage him and swell his ego if he realized she was afraid of him. She deliberately looked away from him and kept her expression as impassive as possible. 
She was certain her feet slowed the closer they got to the fighting arena, but she didn't let herself fall behind. She didn't want Stone to put an encouraging hand on her and drag her along again. They entered from a set of stairs behind the building, and when she emerged through the door, she found herself a level above where she'd been last time, with a clear view of the fighting ring below. It was a much better view than she'd ever wanted. Stone herded her to the seats, where there were two empty ones. She tried to hide her displeasure when she was seated between Calderon and Stone, making herself nod a greeting to the man responsible for financing this horror show. Good evening, senor. He smiled at her, and it should have been a charming display, but his cold, dead eyes robbed of any warmth from the practiced expression. How lovely of you to join us. I am pleased you accepted my invitation. She almost let out a mocking snort, but held back the urge. Thank you for inviting me. Signor shifted slightly in his seat. Dr. Stone seemed to think you would decline. He says you don't have the stomach for the fights, which makes me wonder why you came here to start with. She clenched her hands together in an effort to obscure her attention. I was simply curious. I honestly didn't believe James McCoy when he told me someone was staging illegal bear fights out here. He made a sound low in his throat, one that was difficult to interpret. I see. It is quite a process and an expense to come this far just to satisfy your curiosity. She shrugged, trying to channel a carefree facade. My parents are rich, which means I have an unlimited bank account. I can afford to indulge my curiosity. He still looked unconvinced, but the arrival of the crowd interrupted anything he might have said as they entered noisily. She watched the people below her jostle and shove their way into position, all vying for the best spots to view the atrocities about to take place. There was a general mood of jubilance from the audience, and they were all clearly excited to be here. They turned her stomach as much as Calderon and Stone, because even with all the money in the world, Calderon couldn't have made this work without a bloodthirsty audience demanding that form of entertainment. A few moments later, the bears came in, and she gasped when she recognized Hale. She turned to the senor, sounding more accusatory than she had planned. He shouldn't be fighting already again. He was in the last fights. Senor arched a brow. Rampage remains unbroken, so he has to fight. At first, she assumed he was using the wrong word, though his English had appeared flawless until this point. Unbroken? Do you mean undefeated? The senor chuckled. That, too. So far, he has won all the fights, but I also mean unbroken. His spirit remains intact, and he is still rebellious. Part of the pleasure of this endeavor comes from breaking them. It's quite satisfying to watch them perform acts that go against their human nature, but the bears can't refuse. You're going to make him fight until he's defeated? She was trying to grasp the man's intent. She couldn't seem to, though, because she didn't think the same evil, vile way he did. Perhaps, though it might not take being beaten by a foe to break Rampage. I suspect he'll break internally long before he loses a fight. He sounded satisfied by the idea. Algin leaned closer, putting his arm around her shoulder in a disturbing fashion as he brought his lips far too close to her ear, whispering in an intimate way words that he could have spoken just as easily from a distance. He's strong and stubborn. We keep having to give him ever-increasing amounts of the aggression stimulator to get him to fight. I'm curious to see how much he can take, and Signor Calderon wants to break him. Therefore, he fights in every fight. She closed her eyes for a moment, trying to hide her horrified reaction from the two, knowing giving away any hint of weakness was a bad idea with men like that. I see. She said as emotionlessly as possible. Instead of looking at either one of them, she forced her attention to focus on Hale. It was easy to watch him to start with, until he began to fight with the other bear. It was a vicious exchange, with both animals growling and grunting, and the occasional sounds of pain interspersing their exchange. After less than a minute, she couldn't stand to watch anymore, so she slammed her eyes shut. 
She couldn't leave before the fight ended, since she was Calderon's honored guest, but she didn't have to watch it. Unfortunately, closing her eyes did nothing to block the sound of the fight, accompanied by shouts of approval from the crowd. It was intense, and bile burned up her esophagus as she struggled not to vomit. She had to remain stoic so she could help the two shifters after the fight, and she was determined to find a way off the island and help them be rescued before the next fight. At least there were four days before the next fight, so maybe she had a chance to stop this before the bears had to do it again. Finally, it was over, and she opened her eyes. Rampage was already being led from the arena, the two guards behind him prodding him with cattle prods, while one before him led him with a catch pole. He was still struggling, but they seemed to have the process down pat, clearly having done it so much. The other bear remained unmoving on the floor, and she couldn't hide her dismayed reaction when two handlers came forward with a cart that they wedged under the bear and slid him onto before pushing him out of the arena. He must be seriously injured. No longer caring about offending either of the psychopaths in the box with her, she got to her feet. I need to see to the fighters. She hurried away, a little surprised when neither one tried to stop her. She was completely unsurprised when Guillermo fell into line, shadowing her as she made her way to the enclosure. Like last time, two of the cages were out in the open, close to the entrances for the ring. The handlers were in the process of pushing Hale's cage back, using the pulley system, but the other cage door was open. The bear wasn't in sight, and she walked over to one of the men standing near it. Where's the other fighter? He looked at Guillermo, who must have nodded or given some nonverbal sign of permission before jerking his thumb over his shoulder. Back there. She followed the direction he had pointed, which led her around the back of the enclosure. She stumbled to a halt when she saw the makings of a bonfire piled in an open area free of vegetation. Men were busy loading wood onto the pile, and she looked over to the side and saw the bear on the ground. She moved toward him, and no one challenged her. Even before she reached him, she was certain what she would find. The gaping wound in his throat, along with the deep gash in his chest, had clearly led to him bleeding out. Still, she kneeled down to make sure there were no signs of life, but she found none. She looked at the bonfire they were building and back at the bear before standing up to face Guillermo. Are they planning to burn him? He nodded. It's what they do with them when they die. He seemed unconcerned by it. But what about his family? They'll never know what happened to him, and they have no input on his final arrangements. This isn't right. Guillermo rolled his eyes. I just do what I'm paid to do, senorita. I suggest you do the same if you want to enjoy a long life. She remained long enough to witness for herself that they loaded the bear onto the funeral pyre, requiring six men to lift the heavy body. She was a bit surprised he hadn't changed back into his human form, but she supposed that it made sense he would stay in whatever form he'd been in when he died. The shifter gene wouldn't magically survive the process of death and trigger a mutation back to one form or the other. She didn't stay around for them to light the fire, not needing to see that. Instead, she turned back to the enclosure where they kept the fighters and strode forward, determined to go to Hale. He'd likely need treatment for wounds, and she was afraid there would only be one wound she couldn't heal. He probably knew what had happened, and she was certain he would take it hard. Who wouldn't? Signor Calderon might have finally succeeded in breaking the bear. Hale was in a similar state to how she had left him, though the blood was fresh and the wounds were somewhat different. She barked at a nearby attendant to let her in the cage, and either she was intimidating or Guillermo had provided tacit permission because the man scrambled to comply. As soon as the lock was off and the door was open, she stepped inside, turning to Guillermo as they started to close the door behind her. I'll need that first aid kit or a medical kit if you have one. She didn't wait to see if he replied to her command, in no mood to deal with any resistance. As angry and sad as she felt, she thought she might be able to steamroll the whole complex at that moment. His chest was torn up, and there were deep gashes along his sides, and what appeared to be a bite near his shoulder, but it was his eyes that showed where the true damage lay. 
He must be scarred at a soul-deep level by now. The brown orbs were full of agony and anguish, and she was certain not all the pain was from his physical injuries. Did he know? If not, should she tell him his opponent had died? Guillermo returned with the same first aid kit from before, and she bit back a small sigh, deciding it was better than nothing. She opened it and quickly tended to Hale's wounds, though she could do nothing about the most serious injury, which was in his psyche. Okay, come out of there. The handlers want to put him away for the night. She stiffened at Guillermo's words, turning her head to look at him. I'm not leaving my patient. He was glaring at her. Then you'll be locked in overnight with the shifter. She shrugged a shoulder. So be it. With a sound of exasperation, he gestured toward the handlers to finish their task. She was silent until they had secured Hale's cage along with the others, and a pang shot through her at the sight of the cage that had been occupied earlier in the day. They were down to four shifters now, and she wondered how they acquired more. Perhaps Hale would know the answer if he became alert enough to talk. A few minutes later, he surprised her by opening his eyes. He wasn't completely aware, but he was more conscious than she expected. How do you feel? I killed him. It was a statement, not a question. She nodded, deciding there was no point in lying to him when he already seemed certain of what had happened. It wouldn't do him any good or help him heal faster if he already knew the truth. She reached out and put a hand on his thigh, which happened to be the closest part to her hand. You know it's not your fault, right? Stone pumps you full of aggression stimulators, and you have no choice. He made a sound that was ambiguous, but his tortured expression didn't change. He was one of my own kind, and we had become friendly during our moments of shared alertness. Felix didn't deserve that. Neither did you, Hale. She patted his thigh, ashamed of herself to find she was getting aroused just by touching him in an innocuous fashion while trying to provide comfort. She's right, said a slurred voice from the cage behind them. She looked up at the shifter, realizing he was barely hanging on to consciousness. She nodded. He's right. I know what I did to Alex, said Hale, though he didn't turn his head in the other man's direction. I let them push me to the point of losing all control, and now Felix paid the price for it. You didn't let them do anything. They've been experimenting on you from the day you fell into their clutches, and there's no way you could have held out against the aggression stimulator. He shook his head at her words, either unable or unwilling to argue with them. He seemed so morose, and she leaned forward to push strands of the dark hair off his forehead. Maya glanced at the shifter he'd called Alex again, finding the man had already returned to unconsciousness. Are you friendly with Alex, too? Hale nodded. We grew up together on Bear Island. We were out for a night on the town when a group of men surrounded us. That normally wouldn't have been too much of a concern, because shifters are stronger than humans even in human form, and we could have transformed into our bear form if needed. Before we could do so, or decide how to respond to the threat, Stone had shot us both with tranquilizers, and we woke up here. How long ago was that? With a shrug, Hale said. I'm not sure. Definitely weeks, and probably months. It's hard to keep track of time when you're drugged so much. She nibbled on her lower lip as her brain worked overtime. You're a lot more alert tonight. Did they forget to sedate you when they forced you to transform back? He shrugged again. I don't think so. I've had more periods of control in being able to stay awake or semi-alert for longer stretches. She smiled at him. You must be getting immune to the dose they're giving you. She frowned a second later. You can't let them know that, or they'll increase the dose. He nodded. Figured that out already. His voice was growing more slurred, and his stretch of coherence seemed to be fading. Since she was stuck there for the night, she curled up on a section of the hard cement floor of the cage, trying to make herself into a ball to conserve body heat. It was cold in the enclosure, though she was uncertain if the bear shifters felt it the same way she did. Their metabolism probably burned hotter, so maybe they didn't feel the same chill as she did. Experimentally, she scooted a bit closer to Hale, wanting to see if his skin was warm or cool. 
When she placed her hand on his back, she found he was hotter than she'd expected. She hoped that wasn't a sign of infection. Giving in to temptation, she scooted closer still until she could feel the body heat radiating from him. It helped to take some of the chill from the air, and though it was an uncomfortable slab of concrete, she managed to fall asleep. She woke sometime in the middle of the night, at first uncertain where she was or what had awakened her. It didn't take long for memory to return, allowing her to identify that she was in the cage with Hale, trapped inside the bear enclosure for the night. The why she had awakened took a moment longer to identify, but Hale cried out at that moment, thrashing, and it was clear he was having a nightmare. She got onto her knees, wincing at the cold, hard surface as she did so. Maya leaned over him carefully, gently shaking the shoulder that wasn't injured. Hale, wake up. It was just a nightmare. You're safe. At least for the moment. She couldn't offer him any guarantees beyond that, especially since Signor Calderon had identified him as too rebellious and stubborn and was determined to break him. After another moment, his flailing ceased and his eyes opened. He was more alert than he had been earlier. She could see his gaze was sharper and more focused, though he still suffered from the effects of the drugs they used to control him, as evidenced by his slightly slurred words when he spoke. My mate. She shook her head. What? I knew you were my mate the first moment I smelled you. Her brow furrowed in confusion. She could hear what he was saying, and while she understood the words, she was still having trouble grasping the concept. You smelled me, and you thought I was your mate? Yes. He didn't expound or bother to explain, and perhaps he didn't have the words to do so in his current state. Maybe he didn't even understand the process himself if it was a real thing. What does it mean to be a mate? We mate. We have cubs. And I protect you. Sounds a bit primitive. It certainly did, but she couldn't deny the idea of being his mate sent a warm flush through her, making her feel giddy at the possibility. She quickly shut down that reaction, reminding herself sternly that he was drugged and in no state to know what he was saying or to even make sense. It was far more likely he was having some kind of drug-induced hallucination, and she'd be a fool to put any stock in that. She could still long fiercely for it to be true. It was far too soon to consider being Hale's mate, since she barely knew him, but she was strongly attracted to him, and she could dream he would feel the same if he was released from his drug state and allowed to become himself again. Until that, it was best to ignore such ramblings. That proved to be more difficult than she'd expected when he spoke again. Not worthy. She glared at him. How do you know I'm not worthy of you? You don't even know me. His gaze locked with hers. I am not worthy, he enunciated carefully. Don't deserve happiness, not after what I've done. You had no choice in the matter, she reminded him again with a touch of exasperation. You can't take on all the burdens of the world. It's not like you chose this. He didn't respond, his expression making it difficult to tell if he was falling back asleep or simply brooding. She let out a small sigh and lay down beside him again. Do your people mate for life? Yes. The word rumbled through his chest, where she carefully rested her head to avoid aggravating the wounds there. How does that work? Is it like a human marriage? Yes, but more permanent. It's rare when a pair of bears split up. I've heard of it happening, but I've never actually met anyone who divorced their fated mate. She let out a wistful sigh. It must be nice to know you're marrying for life when you choose to do so with a bear shifter. We don't have formal marriage ceremonies like humans, at least not on traditional cultures. Most of the time these days, couples have both, so they have a legal union. Our system is a bit more primitive, he said, turning her word back on her. How so? She was starting to sound breathless, and it was a direct result of his proximity and how much he made her heart race. If they weren't in a public place, one that was probably monitored by cameras when guards weren't present, she might have been tempted to do more than just cuddle with him. He was in no shape for that anyway, though. I bite you, 
and it infuses you with my pheromones, marking you as mine and warding off other male shifters. I have to bite you periodically to keep my scent on you. She shuddered slightly. That sounds painful. I've heard it makes sex even more pleasurable. I don't know for sure, never having had a mate, until you. That's the sweetest thing anybody half-drugged out of their mind has ever said to me, Hale. She patted his hip where her hand rested. I doubt you'll remember any of this conversation in the morning, but if you do, you're probably going to be embarrassed. Don't be. I realize it's the drugs coursing through you that put you in this state. I'm not taking anything too seriously. He reached for her hand, showing surprising strength in the face of his wounds and drugged state. He wrapped his hand around hers, clinging tightly. I'm not delusional. You're my mate. The earnestness of his voice faded, and he let out an anguished cry. I can't claim you. You deserve someone who's strong and whole, who wasn't manipulated into killing his friends. She felt a surge of impatience, but tried to shove it aside. Keeping her voice soothing and soft, she said, You're more than worthy. You're an honorable man, and I can see how Felix's death is tearing you up inside. I'm not your mate, but if I were lucky enough to be the girl who was, I'd be proud to claim you as mine. You've done nothing of which you should be ashamed. Your friend's passing was a tragedy, but the blame lies with Calderon and Stone, not you. He made a scoffing sound. It wasn't Calderon's teeth that tore through my friend's windpipe, and it wasn't Stone who kept pummeling him and clawing at him even after he'd fallen. The tiniest part of me was aware of what was happening, but I could do nothing to stop it. I kept attacking him, even after he was dead. I can't explain it now, but I couldn't stop then. I can explain it easily enough. It was the aggression stimulators they give you. His lips were set in a straight line and he radiated stubbornness. I know what happened. I only have myself to blame. I'm done talking about it now. With a small sigh of concern, she nodded. Tell me about Bear Island. You said you grew up there? Are there other bear shifters there? A few hundred, he said. It's a sanctuary from the rest of the world where we can move freely among our own kind without having to hide what we are. I was born on the island, and I used to run wild there all year round with Alex and Cade. We used to drive my dad nuts since we were out at all hours in all weather. He's human, though, and he didn't understand the pull of nature or how amazing it is to transform into your bear. It did sound amazing. Who's Cade? He's my cousin. He was older by a few years, but we were all in the same age group, and there aren't a whole lot of kids on the island since it's a small population. We all tended to band together if we were anywhere close to the same age. Were you an only child? He shook his head. I have a younger sister, but she lives in Seattle instead of on the island. My mom died when I was fourteen, and Allison was seven. Dad tried to stick it out on the island a couple of years longer, but he wasn't happy there without Mom. I don't think he had ever been happy on Bear Island, but he loved our mother enough to stay on the island with her. Eventually, he gave up and returned to Seattle, taking Allison with him. I was sixteen, so he let me have the choice of staying on the island or going to the city. There was no choice at all for me, though, because Bear Island is my home, and I felt comfortable among my own kind. So your father and sister still live in Seattle. Do you see them much? He shrugged. I see quite a bit of Allison, even if it's just through Skype. My father remarried a few years ago, and he and Stella like to travel, but I see him at least once or twice a year. She patted his stomach where her hand rested. It sounds a little lonely. I'm really close to my parents. Before I was born, they developed some sort of software system for the military, so we've always been well off, but I never had a nanny or even an au pair. My parents raised me themselves, though sometimes that meant sitting in their office for hours on end as I entertained myself while they wrote code. That sounds nice, but I'm not lonely. I'd like to see more of my dad, but I have had friends and family and a life on Bear Island. 
At least, I had all that until Alex and I decided to go to Seattle, hoping to find our mates. Cade and his mate had recently had their second child, and Cody, our uncle, had mated too. I suppose Alex and I were feeling envious. We already knew our mates weren't on Bear Island, so we started our search in Seattle. We had a half-assed plan to increase the distance of our searches if we didn't have any luck, but we never got a chance to implement that strategy. She stroked his abs, trying to keep him calm. Do you know how they identified you as shifters? He shook his head. No, but I remember Stone had a tablet. Maybe he used that somehow. If I could figure that out, maybe we could stop him from acquiring more shifters. His only answer was a yawn, and she realized he was slipping back to sleep quickly. She was also tired, and though she continued talking softly to him about nothing important, she surrendered to sleep too, content to be held by him at the moment and pretend she really was his mate. Chapter 5 Good morning, lovebirds, boomed Stone in a cheerful voice. It's time to wake up. You have a big day ahead of you, eventually. He chuckled. She jerked awake, immediately alert, and stared at Stone for a second before looking down at Hale. He blinked open his eyes, but his gaze was unfocused. He seemed in more of a stupor than he had last night. Did you drug him again before waking us up? The doctor nodded. I couldn't have him too alert or trying to resist. Signor Calderon has big plans for you both, and I need him docile and cooperative for the day. Her heart stuttered at the words, though she struggled to hide her fear. What kind of plans? Shooting her a smug smile, he just shrugged. You'll find out. In the meantime, Guillermo is going to escort you back to your room and lock you in. I have certain preparations to make with the shifter, and it will be easier without you around. Her eyes widened when she realized they planned to separate them. Fear was growing stronger, and she was afraid a bit of it had leaked through her voice when she spoke again. What kind of preparations? What are you going to do to him? He nodded at Guillermo, who seemed to be asking silent permission to open the cage and gather her. As the guard unlocked the padlock and swung open the door, his hand fastening on Maya's arm to drag her out, Stone leered at her. I think a better question is what will your bear shifter do to you? He laughed clearly delighting in their suffering. Take her to her room and make sure she can't escape. Those are Signor Calderon's orders. Whatever you have planned, you won't get away with this. It was an ineffectual thing to say, but she felt better for speaking at all, for trying to resist whatever they had planned. She tried fighting Guillermo when he dragged her the rest of the way out of the cage, but he easily subdued her. Hale let out a roar suddenly, and though he was in human form, it had a distinct bear-like quality. Despite the drugs flowing through him, he was making a serious effort to get off the floor and keep her from slipping away. Before he could accomplish the goal, he collapsed to the floor again, and Guillermo secured the lock again. I hope you rot in hell! Stone ignored her, clearly caught up in his own work, which didn't bode well for her or Hale. What could they have planned for her? An even better question was, what would they have planned for her and Hale together? Her blood ran cold as she considered the possibilities, and she had plenty of time to do so after Guillermo locked her in her room and left her there for the next several hours. She paced and worried, simultaneously wanting to know what was happening while dreading the discovery that would answer her questions. She wanted out of this room, she wanted answers, but most of all, she just wanted to be in Hale's arms again. Guillermo came for her a little after seven, openly laughing at her when she tried to dart past him through the door and escape. He clamped an arm around her waist, holding her immobile for a moment as he shook her lightly. I have no wish to harm you, Cinerita, but they won't care if I am required to, as long as I deliver you in one piece. A chill swept through her, and she nodded her head to indicate she understood. She let her body go limp, and he put her on her feet a second later. Guillermo maintained a grasp on her, his hand wrapped around her bicep, as he steered her out of the house. Where are we going? What's going on? 
What does Stone plan to do with us? He simply grunted in lieu of answering, prodding her along when she started to slow. She quickly realized their destination was the fighting arena, though she'd expected it to be the enclosure. The house was set far back on the island, but the fighting arena was in sight, and he increased his pace the closer they got. By the time they reached the wooden building with the metal doors, she was having to almost run to keep up with him. She suspected it was a deliberate gesture on his part to further weaken and throw off her balance. They entered the building from the back entrance, a new route for her. There were two sets of stairs in front of them, one with the flight going down and one with the flight going up. He skipped both of them in favor of turning into a doorway past them. It was a scantily decorated room composed mainly of raw timber walls and cement flooring. She trembled when she saw Stone was waiting for her. The man himself was not overly imposing, but the syringe in his hand certainly was, as was the gleam in his eyes. It was disturbing, though she couldn't identify what emotions he was feeling. Guillermo jerked her to a stop in front of the scientist, and she glared at Stone. Why am I here? What are you planning? Strip her, said Stone before focusing his attention on her questions. You're here because you're going to assist in an experiment. For months, we've been trying to get the shifters to breed, either with each other or human partners, but they refuse to. It doesn't matter how much the goons beat them or how many times they're shocked. They won't breed the men and women we provide. Her eyes widened at the horrific revelations. Why would you even want to? Are you planning to set up a shifter pimp service on the side? He actually looked intrigued by the idea. I hadn't considered it, but it might be an interesting source of revenue. We take only the most exclusive clients, of course, which means those huge bank accounts. He grinned, and it was creepy. Thank you for the suggestion. She shook her head. I wasn't being serious. He laughed. I know, which is what makes it so perfect. You've come up with an excellent idea for exploiting our resources, and you did it because you're being sarcastic and thinking of the most improbable thing that could come to mind. It's a stroke of genius, really. However, we're not opening a shifter brothel tonight. Then what are you doing? It's obvious Rampage has a hard-on for you, so it seems plausible that he'll finally breed. I ramped up his pheromones, so I doubt he'll be able to resist. She batted Guillermo's hands away when he tried to take off her hoodie. Stop that! Undress her, said Stone. He sounded bored. As she struggled to keep Guillermo from removing her clothing, she glared at Stone. I still don't understand why you want them to breed. He let out a small sigh. It's incredibly difficult to identify shifters. I stumbled across the gene while I was working at a hospital, and over the years, I've developed a computer program that helps me analyze certain physical traits of shifters, which include a more rapid heart rate and a higher core temperature. That can only tell me so much, though, so only blood can confirm if the person we're taking is a shifter. We've acquired several subjects that turned out to be simply human perhaps ill or having recently exercised rather than being shifters it would be far more efficient to breed our own shifters for the program she was busy trying to keep guillermo from stripping off her jeans since he had managed to steal her hoodie and rip away her t-shirt underneath you're planning to breed bear shifters for the fights that's barbaric stone surprised her by agreeing it is barbaric. There are far nobler purposes to which we could put shifters, including studying them for medical science and finding ways to accelerate human healing and increase our lifespan. But as I told you earlier, I have to go where the funding is. Signor Calderon prefers the entertainment of the bears fighting, so it is a necessary evil to be able to do my research. Evil's the right word, she panted as she beat at Guillermo's back. He forced her to the cold cement floor, stripping off her clothes aside from her panties. She let out a cry of outrage when a needle entered her hip a moment later. What's that? What are you doing to me? I'm simply boosting your pheromones so you'll drive the bear shifter wild. He's getting a similar treatment, though Signor Calderon forced me to add aggression stimulators to the mix. He didn't understand how that can taint the results of the experiment. I don't give a flying fuck about your experiments, 
she shouted as Guillermo allowed her to get to her feet. She crossed her arms over her chest, wondering when she had lost her bra in the struggle. I just want you all to die. He gave her a cool look. Ironically enough, you could be the one who dies, depending on how much your precious shifter can maintain control of himself. I see no valuable purpose for the aggression stimulator, though Signor Calderon seems to think it will encourage him to perform, when he might otherwise be reluctant to do so. I'm afraid it's going to push him over the edge, and he might fuck you to death. That would be a shame for the experiment, and a lost opportunity. My heart breaks for you. She tilted her head, glaring up at him. There's no way Hale would deliberately hurt me. You don't know him at all if you think that. Hopped up on aggression and sexual desire, there's no telling what he's going to do. I really wouldn't want to be in your shoes. He laughed, and though it was a soft sound, it still grated on her nerves. Go check with Signor Calderon and see if he's ready for us to release her to the arena. Guillermo did as ordered, leaving her almost naked in Stone's presence. She backed away from him as he advanced on her, nerves suddenly tight. When he pressed her against the wall, she let out a small cry of shock. Back up! He laughed again. I'd really looked forward to sampling your charms, Maya. The connection between us was obvious from the start, and I felt it like a jolt the moment our eyes met the first night at the fight. I'm having to make a sacrifice for science by letting you go, but I really need the data you can provide. She shook her head at him. You're a crazy man, just like Calderon. This whole island is full of crazy, evil, brutal people, aside from your victims. He struck suddenly, moving as fast as a snake, which was an apt description. She tried to clamp her thighs shut, but she wasn't fast enough to prevent him from burying a finger in her. She let out a sound of disgust and tried to push him away. Don't touch me! He pulled his hand from her and licked his finger in an obscene way. I simply wanted a little taste since I won't get to sample the whole thing. Perhaps after your breeding sessions, if you manage to get pregnant, then I can have a little fun while we wait for the delivery. She raised her hand and slapped him across the face as hard as she could. You're a disgusting little creep! He retaliated in exactly the same fashion, slapping her hard across the face, which sent her staggering sideways for a moment. I hope you survive the experiment, and not just because of scientific curiosity. He licked his lips in a long, drawn-out fashion. You're going to pay for that slap, but not tonight. Tonight, you have a different destiny, and I can't wait to see if you survive it. She didn't give him the satisfaction of a response, though inside she wondered the same thing. Would she survive facing off with a horny, aggressive bear shifter who believed she was his mate? The potential for violence was astronomical, and she was fearful when Guillermo returned to indicate Calderon was ready. She tried not to let it show as she walked of her own volition to the stairs, choosing the flight leading down when Guillermo nodded his head in that direction. It was the longest, hardest walk of her life, though the distance was actually moderate. It was knowing what was at the end of the trip that was so nerve-wracking. How would she find Hale? More importantly, would he recognize her at all, or would he simply see her as a female with which to rut? When they reached the bottom of the stairs, Guillermo shoved her through a door, slamming it behind her. She shivered when she heard the lock engage a moment later. Whatever they had in mind for her, she wouldn't find an escape through that route. Cautiously, she took a step forward and looked around, instantly realizing she was in the fighting arena. She shivered, both with cold and fear, and a hint of embarrassment at having all her curves and flaws on display, for the jerks watching whatever they had in mind. She had a feeling she knew what was in mind, and it was a relief to see Hale enter the ring a moment later in his human form, rather than the bear version. They seemed like sadistic enough men that they would have enjoyed sending the bear version of Hale to ravish her. The human side was a huge relief. At least until he got closer, and she saw the wild, unfocused look in his eyes. He was in human form, but it was clear his bear was dominant. She swallowed a lump of fear in her throat and braced herself as he reached her. Hello, Hale. She kept her tone even and calm, hoping it would transmit to him. 
He showed no visible reaction to her speaking to him. Instead, he lifted her off her feet to press her against the wall. She winced when her back collided with the rough stone, and she tried to maintain eye contact with the bear shifter, attempting to reach the human side of him. You're better than what they expect from you, Hale. I know you can control this. His pupils were dilated, and they seemed to shrink slightly as she spoke, gently caressing his shoulder as she did so. Taking a leap of faith, she relaxed against him and pressed her head to his chest. Don't let them get the best of you. He didn't move for a moment, and when he did, it was to tighten his grasp on her. He buried his face in her hair and inhaled deeply. Mine, he said in a growl. Ours, he said in the same tone. She inferred that he meant his and his bear's. There was no way she could completely talk him out of this, she realized, because he was too far gone and under the control of the drugs they'd given him. The best she could do was to try to keep him on the calm side, so he'd be gentler than they expected. With that in mind, she tried to relax against him, keeping her tone soothing as she whispered to him while his hand moved down her body. He cupped her breast, tugging a little more forcefully than she would have liked, but she couldn't deny the simple touch was enough to start making her slick. Apparently, he realized it too because his nostrils flared and his pupils widened again. His hand moved from her breast to between her legs, and his fingers surged inside her rapidly moistening folds. It was uncomfortable for a moment, but his fingers flexing rhythmically inside her soon increased her own natural lubrication, until she was soaked. In his current state, he seemed incapable of foreplay. Hale shifted her, lowering her body to the right angle. She made it easier on both of them by clamping her thighs around his hips, needing to hold on in her current position. She clung to him, torn between fear and desire, as he brought his large erection against her opening. She took a deep breath as he surged inside her, wincing at the stretched, burning feeling for a moment. Her body acclimated soon enough, and she was surprised by how much she was enjoying his rough possession. Every deep thrust of his hips, which bucked rapidly, pushed her back against the wall, but she was mostly unaware of the small discomfort as Hale thrust into her. She was shocked to feel herself rapidly approaching an orgasm. That she was having one from intercourse was surprising enough, since she'd never achieved that before. She'd had orgasms during sex with a partner, but it always required some additional stimulation on her part. Perhaps it was because he was filling her so completely and hitting all of her most sensitive spots, or maybe it was simply because it was Hale himself. Something about him made the whole experience different and far more enjoyable than her few previous attempts. He groaned as he pressed deeply into her, and the twitching of his cock was enough to trigger her own release. Her walls clamped around him, and she shuddered in his arms as she came. While she was hitting the peak of pleasure, she let out a startled yelp when Hale bit her on the shoulder. It should have hurt, but instead, it seemed to heighten her climax, and she released a small cry of satisfaction as she clung to him even tighter. She was still twitching and pulsing when Hale abruptly pulled away from her and turned his back to her. In a second, he transformed into his bear form, and he was even more magnificent up close than he'd been from a distance. She was in awe for a moment, but fear returned as she realized she was trapped in the arena with an angry bear. Hopefully, his orgasm had taken the edge off his pheromone-induced need for her, at least. He turned back to her, clamping his mouth around her arm. She braced herself for pain, but it never came. He was trying to tug her forward, and she realized he wanted her to follow him. I understand, she said, meeting his gaze. His eyes were exactly the same as the bear and as a human, and she could lose herself in the amber-brown color if the circumstances were different. Instead, she squared her shoulders and tried not to worry about her breasts jiggling as she kept up with Hale. His big furry head jerked her to the right, and she understood he wanted her to head that way. It was the door through which he had come, and when his pace suddenly increased to a run, she intuited that he planned to break through the door. She slowed down for a moment, not wanting to be hit by any flying debris, and waited until the door burst under the force of his collision. The cracking sound of the wood filled the air, along with Hale's roar of what appeared to be satisfaction. 
As soon as the debris settled, she rushed forward to join him again, doing her best to keep up with the bear. Most people scattered out of their way, though a couple of crazy fools tried to stop Hale's escape. He roared at both of them each time, lifting a massive paw and striking them out of the way. She didn't bother to look to see if they were okay after that. She really didn't care, but she was fairly certain they wouldn't be anyway. He had massive paws and a surprising amount of strength considering he was still under the effects of whatever drugs they'd given him. Perhaps the aggression stimulator was working to his benefit for a change. Hale ran straight for the water, and she did her best to keep up on her bare feet. She winced at the rocks and sticks poking through her soles, but tried not to lose any speed. There were three guards at the dock, and their sole job appeared to be to safeguard the six motorboats tied up there. One ran before facing Hale, but the other two stood their ground. She was appalled to realize they had guns, and though she didn't know makes or models, they looked like semi-automatic or automatic assault rifles. With this kind of operation, they were probably fully automatic. Hale charged the first one, sending the man flying. She winced automatically when his flesh collided with a pylon holding up the dock. It made a sickening crunching sound, and he moaned as he slumped into the waist-deep water. He was in no danger of drowning as long as he didn't pass out, but she wasn't about to offer a helping hand to drag him in. The other guard didn't wait for Hale to whack him. He simply stepped aside. She eyed him doubtfully, finding it too easy, but he was standing passively, clearly not wanting to provoke the already enraged bear. She kept a cautious eye on him as she approached the first boat and sat inside. It rocked a bit, and the transition from the dock to the boat was perilous, but she had managed to not fall in. She looked at Hale, patting the seat beside her. Hurry up and change back so we can go before Calderon's reinforcements arrive. He shook his shaggy head, and she frowned at him. You better not think I'm leaving alone. You're coming with me. He made a chuffing sound that could have been a bear's version of a laugh. It was an ambiguous sound, though, so she couldn't be certain. She watched with confusion as he approached the second boat, shaking her head. We can fit in the same one. A second later, he raised a large paw and swiped it through the motor attached to the boat, rendering the mechanics of it useless. The only way they could use it now was as a rowboat. Grasping his intent, she waited impatiently as he slashed through the motors of the remaining four boats before returning to the end of the dock where their boat was moored. In less than a second, he transformed from his bear form back into the human hail with whom she'd become familiar. His movements were hasty when he lifted the rope from the dock before jumping into the water, scrambling into the side of the boat. Let's go. She could see why they posted armed guards, because the fools also left the keys in the ignition. That was convenient for her, so she wasn't going to complain about their lax security. She turned the ignition, holding her breath as she waited for the boat to fire a life. She half expected it to sputter and die, especially since he'd already disabled the other five boats. That would be just about the kind of luck she'd come to expect over the last few days. Instead, the boat started right away with a smooth purr, the engine vibrating the boat in a subtle way. Maya had never driven a motorboat before, but she found the motivation to learn quickly when she heard a stampede of feet and shouting growing closer. The takeoff was anything but smooth, sending them both slamming back into their seats, and she surged to her feet a moment later, clinging to the wheel as she adjusted the speed after spending a second figuring out how to do so. A moment later, she increased their speed again when she heard gunshots firing behind them. One collided with the side of the boat, admitting a high-pitched squeal of metal against metal. She assumed it must have grazed the side since the bullet didn't penetrate through the hull and the boat didn't spring a leak. She had the boat at full speed, not daring to throttle it down until they were several miles into the ocean. It was nerve-wracking trying to navigate in the dark, and she was thankful that at least they had almost a half-moon by which to see. A full moon would have been better. After setting the motor at a reasonable pace, she glanced over at Hale. He was pale, and he looked off. She frowned at him. Are you all right? I'm better now that I'm out of that place. It wasn't exactly an answer, but she didn't press him. Where to? Bear Island. 
She nodded, trying not to feel a little nervous about approaching an island full of bear shifters. If they were anything like Hale, they wouldn't hurt her. She had a feeling they were all more human than Calderon and Stone, with their nefarious plots and complete lack of ethics. That sounds like a solid plan, but I don't know how to get there. He leaned forward to pop open a compartment, making a small sound of triumph as he pulled out a large paper map. This should help us find it. Her attention wasn't on the map, though. She swayed on her feet when she saw the deep wound and bright red blood covering Hale's lower back. Were you shot? Even as she asked the question, she knew he had been. The wound was gaping and bleeding, so how could it have been from anything else? He nodded once. I'm fine. She gasped. You're not fine. You're shot. You've been shot. He arched a brow. Believe it or not, I'm fully aware of that. She rolled her eyes at his attitude, but inclined her head toward the wheel. Take over so I can look for a first aid kit. I'll get it. Before she could argue with him or point out that he shouldn't move around since he was experiencing blood loss, he was out of the seat and searching the boat. There were two sets of seats along with a small swimming deck where one could jump into the water from the boat. He found an adequate first aid kit under the second seat, returning to the front seat a moment later. He moved with surprising agility for someone who had been shot, but it was clear he was in pain by the way he grimaced. I can't steer the boat and treat your wound at the same time. Can you drive? I think we can spare a couple of minutes to not move the boat at all. His words were logical, but she feared they hid the fact that he was uncertain he had the strength to steer the boat while she worked on his back. She didn't call him on it as she slid the gear upward while easing off the gas. When they had fully stopped, she engaged the anchor for a moment, happy Calderon had invested in a top-of-the-line motorboat with all the bells and whistles. Everything except an operating table, though she hadn't removed projectiles from any of her simulation models yet. I wish I had some anesthetic. I wish I did too, especially if you're operating while sedated. She almost slapped him on the shoulder, but remembered he was wounded at the last moment. Ha ha, very funny. If you're feeling up to making jokes, I guess you'll be okay while I clean the wound and see if you need stitches. She was just saying that, though, because she couldn't stitch up his wound yet. It was obvious the bullet was still somewhere in his body, since there was no exit wound, and she had no idea where that might be. She lacked the tools to go digging for the bullet, and she wasn't certain she'd have the stomach for it anyway. She'd performed different surgical simulations on various animal simulation models they were assigned, and she'd dissected a few real animals, but those left her unprepared for the thought of digging into his entry wound and trying to find the bullet. She couldn't imagine inflicting that kind of pain on her lover. With a start, she realized that was correct. It had been a brief, rough encounter, but it had satisfied her. She couldn't wait to do the whole thing again, though more slowly and without perverts watching or the threat of imminent death hanging over their heads. In the end, she simply irrigated the wound with some sterile saline water from a pouch before applying a gauze pad and tape. It was ineffectual, but it was the best she could do with the supplies she had. She suspected her actions were more for her benefit than his, because she needed to feel like she was doing something, even if that something really did nothing to ease his pain. It might reduce his risk of infection, though, and she tried to cling to that thought as she put the boat in gear a few minutes later and followed Hale's instructions. Since Bear Island was also part of the San Juan Islands chain, it was a surprisingly short trip between his island and the one Calderon had commandeered. It still took more than an hour, and he was pale and sweaty by the time they arrived. The gauze pad had leaked through less than ten minutes after she had applied it, but he refused the suggestion of changing it again. They both knew there was no point, though she hadn't wanted to say that aloud, and apparently he didn't either. She was uncertain if that was for her benefit or his own. She smiled at him as she drew closer to the dock, where he indicated they should park. We're going to get you help now. He nodded tersely. You can't go up there naked. She blinked, startled to realize she was still naked. It was the first time she'd been aware of it during their escape. I don't really have much choice. His lips tightened, and he reached into the first aid kit, sorting methodically until he produced a small silver square. 
Put this on. She frowned down at it as she took it. The package fit in the palm of her hand. I don't think it's going to fit. He sighed in exasperation. Open it up. It's an emergency blanket. You can cut a hole out of the middle and wear it like a poncho. She nodded, enthusiastic about his plan as she unfolded the blanket and then refolded it in a way so that she could snip off a half circle to form a neck hole. She held her breath as she cut with surgical scissors, letting out a small whoosh of relief a moment later to discover she had properly folded the blanket and it would work as planned. She dropped it over her head. Now can we get you some help? Even in his pain and state of excessive blood loss, he managed to laugh softly. Help is here. She looked up, startled by at least two dozen pairs of eyes focused on them. The eyes belonged to a mix of human and bear faces, and their postures suggested they were wary. Hale got slowly to his feet, holding up his hands. It's me, Hale Lassiter. She tensed as the crowd whispered among itself before one solid form stepped forward, distinguishing himself from the rest. He wore a dark blue jacket, and even in the illumination provided by the half-moon, she could see the gleam of a badge pinned to his lapel. What happened to you, Hale? You disappeared months ago without a word to anyone. It's a long story. He started to sway. She lunged forward to catch him, taking the brunt of his weight, which nearly made her knees collapse for a moment. She glared up at the officer. He's been shot. He needs help. The rest of the story can come later. There was a new kind of urgency to the crowd, and the law enforcement official barked orders before he and a few others slid down the steep embankment, moving at an angle, and reached the section where the boat was docked in record time. She experienced a surge of hesitancy and concern about turning over Hale to this group of men, but reminded herself he was a bear shifter too, and if he wasn't frightened, she had no reason to be either. They lifted him from the boat, and she saw him wince. Be careful, she snapped. You're hurting him. It's okay, Maya. They kind of have to in order to get me out of the boat and up to the doctor. He was so stoic that she wasn't certain if she should be impressed or frustrated. Instead, she focused on his words. There's a doctor on the island? Of course, answered the one wearing the blue jacket and badge. Then get him there as quickly as possible. Cade grinned down at Hale. Your woman's a bossy little thing. Nah, she's just looking out for me. The words were growing more slurred, and his eyes were starting to close. He'd clearly used the last reserves of his strength to get them to the island, and now that he was in safe hands, he was allowing himself to actually feel his injury. Why don't you just shift, Hale? He glanced to his back as he helped carry them up the steep stairs none of them had bothered with when they had slid down the side a few moments before. He winced at the wound. It's the fastest way. Can't, Cade. He trailed off, his eyes closing. They blinked a couple of times and then stayed shut. You're his cousin, Cade? Are you that, Cade? Cade nodded. I am. Who are you? It's a long story, and I'll tell you after the doctor sees Hale, but he insists we're mates. Cade looked startled for a moment and then shrugged. Why hasn't he already transformed? Did you ask him not to? He scowled, clearly displeased at that thought. She shook her head emphatically. He transformed previously to being shot, but he didn't in the boat because there wasn't enough room. They've also been pumping him full of drugs, so it could be his healing ability isn't working with transformation. I'll let the doctor figure that out. Who is they? He asked, grunting as he lifted the Travoyas, the last step up, ascending to the next level of the island with Hale secure in the middle of the group carrying him. They're bad people, and I'll tell you all about it once I'm sure Hale will be okay. The doctor lived in one of the largest cabins arranged on the single main street of the town on the island. She had expected someone to ask her to leave, but no one had even glanced at her as they transferred him from the Travoyas to the surgical table so Dr. Burrow could have room to work on him. They took Hale into a large room at the front of the cabin, and she trailed behind, still expecting someone to tell her to leave. They seemed not to notice she was there, so she pressed her back into the corner and watched them place him on the metal exam table draped with a plastic-lined cloth sheeting. 
There was an extensive array of medical tools within the doctor's reach, and he put a mask over his face a moment later. Hale slumped against the table, completely losing any tension in his body. He had already been unconscious, but now he was clearly sedated. It tugged at her heart to see him in that state again, though she knew Dr. Burrow and the other shifters had Hale's best interest in mind and acted accordingly. It wouldn't have been kindness to operate on him without anesthetic. Her legs trembled and her knees went weak, robbing her of the ability to stand when the doctor picked up a scalpel. The sight of blood wasn't what bothered her, though he hadn't cut yet. It was simply the idea of Hale's suffering that left her feeling woozy. She slid down the wall, planting her butt in the corner, and pressed her back to the hard surface. She closed her eyes, tipped her head back, and tried not to visualize the surgery he was undergoing. She couldn't understand why she cared so much. She would have felt sympathy for anyone in such circumstances, but it shouldn't have induced this full-body state of dread and a deep gnawing fear in her gut at the possibility of losing him. What if he didn't wake up? What if he got an infection and died? What if the drug they had given him over the past months he'd been captive had somehow interfered with his own natural healing ability at a permanent level rather than just temporarily? If that was the case, an infection might kill him with or without antibiotics. He could die on the table. She was working herself into quite a state, so she forced her eyes open as she took several deep breaths. Rather than look at Hale or the surgery, she focused on the monitor someone had hooked up to his heart, which checked his pulse and blood pressure continuously. They were holding steady, which was a good sign, and he seemed to be doing just fine. It somewhat eased her anxiety, though she was still fearful. It was crazy how much the idea of losing him devastated her. They barely knew each other, and the circumstances under which they had met would likely taint any relationship possibility anyway. He claimed she was his mate, but he also was drugged out of his mind. It was difficult to put any faith in his words under those circumstances. It surprised her how much she wanted to, though. The idea of being his mate sent a shiver of pleasure through her, along with a dart of longing. She found herself hoping not only that he made it through the surgery and recovered completely, but that his mind hadn't been so numbed from the drug Stone gave him that he had imagined the connection between them. She wanted to be his mate. She must have fallen asleep in the corner, but she awoke on a surprisingly comfortable air mattress. She yawned and stretched, opening her eyes as gaps in the blinds allowed sunlight to filter in. At first she thought that was what had woken her, but quickly realized it was a moan from Hale instead. Alarmed, she sat up on the air mattress and looked around quickly, ascertaining they were in a patient recovery room and someone had thoughtfully moved her from the operating room into Hale's room, placing her on the mattress so she could sleep. He must have been sleeping too, but he was restless and thrashing. She walked over to him, automatically touching his forehead before glancing at the monitor. His blood pressure was steady, but his pulse rate had skyrocketed. He thrashed and moaned again, calling out, no, I won't do it. The hand on his forehead she had placed there to check for fever that wasn't present started stroking his hair instead. She leaned closer, keeping her voice gentle. It's okay. You're just having a nightmare. All that's behind you now, Hale, and you're safe on Bear Island. He didn't fully wake up, but he did stop twitching and thrashing, and his sleep appeared less disturbed within a few minutes. She kept stroking his hair until her hand grew tired, certain he wasn't aware of it on a conscious level, but perhaps he could feel the soothing caress subconsciously. Even if it did nothing for him, it was soothing her. When she could no longer stroke his hair, she held his hand in hers. She looked up when the door opened and Dr. Burrow stepped inside. How is he, doctor? The doctor winked at her. I haven't had a chance to examine him yet. But let's find out. He was doing well last night, and every time I checked on him, his vitals were steady. I think he'll be just fine, but let me take a look at him before I confirm that. She stood out of the way, though it sent a physical pain through her to have to release the hand she'd held. The doctor was thorough but fast as he checked Hale's vital signs, took his temperature, and peeked at the wound on his stomach. That was where the bullet had lodged, she inferred, from the thick bandages there. 
the doctor must have had to go in from the abdomen to retrieve the bullet. He stepped back with a nod, looking satisfied. I think he just needs some rest. He's recovering like a typical human versus an Ursa sapiens, so I'm not entirely sure how long it will be before he's up on his feet. Once he's more awake, we'll try to get him to shift. The scientist on that island has been using some kind of inhibitor and stimulator to force the shifters to change into their bear forms and back again after fighting. He's ramped up their aggression level so they have a difficult time not fighting each other, and his last experiment involved tampering with Hale's hormones and pheromones. I hope he hasn't physiologically damaged Hale so that he can't shift to heal. You don't think he can shift anymore? The doctor looked concerned and saddened by the possibility. She quickly shook her head. No, I'm sorry, that wasn't what I meant. He shifted so we could escape, and then shifted back to his human form to get into the boat. I've seen him shift, but it didn't help him heal. I really don't know when he was shot, though. Maybe it was after we were already in the boat. Everything's a bit of a blur, to be honest, and I can't seem to focus on it. I guess I'm just concerned that whatever Stone did to his DNA has left permanent damage. The doctor nodded, clearly understanding now. I'm no geneticist, but I'm sure we have a few in our network, since we have to carefully hide the differences between Ursa sapiens and Homo sapiens. There's usually a shifter in every lab around the country, particularly in areas there's a high concentration of shifters, like Seattle and the surrounding areas. She nodded. That makes perfect sense, but the system fell apart somewhere. Stone told me he found out about bear shifters by running lab results in a hospital where he used to work. The doctor sighed. We can't always control the flow of information. All shifters know to look for another shifter for their medical care, but it could be the person whose blood tipped off Stone had been brought in unconscious or on the edge of death. If that was the case, they would have run routine blood tests, and no shifter would have known to be the one to intercept them. His theory made sense, but she supposed they'd never know unless Stone volunteered the information. With any luck, she'd never see his creepy little eyes again. If she did, she was going to ram her knee into his private parts and enjoy the sounds of him howling in pain. He deserved that, and more, for everything he'd done to the shifters at his mercy, and for what he'd wanted to do to her. Let him rest for a while, and then you can see him again when he wakes up. I'd rather stay with him, and I don't have anywhere to go anyway. At least not on Bear Island. She had a nice little apartment off campus, courtesy of her parents, but she wasn't returning to Seattle until Hale awakened and she learned about his state of health. Part of her hoped she'd never have to leave him anyway, though she wasn't certain about settling on this tiny, quiet island. The doctor's shaggy brows drew together to form a V. You should just stay at his place. He's your mate, right? She shrugged a shoulder. That's what he said, but he was also drugged out of his mind. The doctor chuckled. The mating instinct is incredibly powerful. I don't think there's a drug in existence that could completely dull the sense. If he claimed you as his mate, you're his. She frowned. How does he claim me as his mate? Her cheeks filled with color as she asked the doctor the question, assuming it involved sex, but not sure if it was the only element. Has he bitten you at any point during intimate relations? She started to shake her head and then recalled abruptly the way his teeth had buried into her shoulder during that moment in the fighting ring when they were both climaxing. She nodded slowly. But just once? The doctor grinned. That's as good as a marriage ceremony in our culture. Feel free to use his cabin. What's his is yours and vice versa. She was in a bit of a stupor, stunned by the doctor's revelation, but not so out of it that she couldn't follow his directions to find Hale's cabin. The door was unlocked when she reached it, and she stepped inside, wrinkling her nose at the musty smell. She flipped on the light switch, and a warm glow filled the room. He must have favored the kind of light bulbs that resembled daylight. There was a layer of dust on everything, and the cabin looked like it had been abandoned. 
There was a sad, forlorn air about the lot, and for a moment she was tempted to step back onto the porch and ask to stay somewhere else. Anywhere else, for that matter. Instead, she squared her shoulders and forced herself to concentrate on bringing it back to a livable state. Everything seemed well cared for and cozy, and she imagined it would be a comfortable place to live after it was cleaned and restored. Cleaning also gave her something on which to focus, besides her concern for Hale and remembering their brief, rough, but satisfying breeding session in the fighting ring. She hesitated to call it anything but that, because there hadn't been an emotional connection between them at the time. He had been too drugged, and she had been too frightened to even think about emotions. It had been primal and carnal, but it wasn't the way she would have chosen to seal a marriage. If they were really married now, she wanted a do-over for the mating night, or would that be a mating moon instead of a honeymoon? She had no idea, and she amused herself with speculating and inventing names for it as she finished cleaning the cabin. Two hours and a shower later, the place sparkled and looked much better. The unwelcoming air had given way to something that was cozy and inviting. The wood in the rack still seemed good, so she'd been able to build a small fire. It probably wasn't cool enough to really need it, but it was cheerful, and the crackling of the logs in the fire provided welcome background noise. Since she didn't have any clothing, she'd appropriated Hale's robe while she washed her clothes in the small apartment-sized washer and dryer tucked away into a tiny storage area behind the folding doors. The cabin wasn't large or lavish, but it was functional and quaint. It was growing on her rapidly. She jumped when there was a knock at the door, ensuring the robe was tightened around her, the knot secure, before she moved forward to open the wooden door. Cade stood on the other side with a bag in one hand. My maid has some clothes for you. She's not sure if they'll fit, but I think you're both about the same size. She smiled her pleasure as she reached for the bag. Please tell your mate... What's her name? Shayla, said Cade. Please tell Shayla thank you for me. I'm sure I can find something that works. He nodded his head. You might want to hurry because Hale is waking up and I figured you'd want to be there with him when he's fully aware. She nodded eagerly as she took the bag and ran down the hallway to the sole bedroom in the small cabin. She pushed open the rough timber door and stepped inside, closing it behind her before dumping the bag on the bed. Shayla had provided two pairs of pants and three shirts. The biggest surprise were the two pairs of underwear with the tags still attached. They were completely sexy and revealing, and not at all practical. She assumed the other woman hadn't gotten around to wearing them for her husband yet. While she would have preferred a pair of cotton briefs, she certainly wasn't going to get snippy because someone had given her the wrong kind of new underwear. Instead, she pulled the tag off the plainer pair, though that was a subjective comparison. They were both lacy, frothy concoctions meant to seduce rather than cover. There weren't any bras, so she would have to let the girls fly free. She couldn't stand the thought of putting on the bra she had worn for the past few days, having washed it every night in the maid's bathroom in the room she'd been using at Calderon's estate. It was still in the washer anyway, and she wasn't going to wear a wet bra. When she was dressed, she quickly returns to Cade, who stood in virtually the same pose she had left him, his gaze quiet and watchful. He appeared to have a lot of patience, which was a virtue she admired, though never fully understood. They walked together to Dr. Burrow's cabin, and her stomach fluttered with nerves as she stepped through the door, followed by Cade. She knew where she was going, so she headed toward the room where she had left Hale earlier. When she reached it, she stepped over the threshold with a deep breath, bracing herself for anything. He looked much better than she'd expected, and she blinked in surprise. What did you do to him? She directed the question at the doctor, who sat in the recliner near the bed, scrawling notes on the big yellow legal pad. The doctor looked up and grinned at her. I had him transform a couple of times. It speeds up the healing process, but his body isn't working the way it was designed to. He'll probably need a couple of days to heal completely, and I hope once all the drugs are cleared out of his system, he'll be as efficient at healing as he used to be. She nodded to indicate she'd heard his words, but her gaze didn't deviate from Hale's. She gave him a soft smile as she moved closer to the bed. How do you feel? He shrugged. I'll live. 
His words were more of a terse dismissal than a response, and he looked around her to see Cade. You should arrange for Miss Cole to get back to Seattle as quickly as possible. A sharp pang in her chest made her gasp quietly, and she had to take a deep breath to avoid shouting at him. I'm not going back to Seattle, at least not yet. I need to know you're going to be fine. You heard the doctor. I just have to transform some more. Otherwise, it's a wait and see about the ability to heal. With all the drugs they gave me, there's no telling how scrambled my senses are or what state my body's in. I probably made all kinds of faulty assumptions. She gasped again when she realized what he was inferring. He was trying to take back his mate declaration. Sadness welled in her, but she struggled to hide it. He was still incapacitated, and the last thing he needed was an argument. He looked at his cousin again. Cade, get her out of here. She turned to glance at Cade, feeling a little sympathy for him and his conflicted expression. I'm not leaving until Hale is up for a real conversation conducted logically and not obscured by pain medication and mind-numbing drugs. That sounds fair to me. Damn it, Cade. Get rid of her. I'm trying to do the right thing. Cade chuckled. And apparently, she doesn't want you to do that. I suggest you just focus on recuperating for now, and when you're better, you can kick her off the island yourself if that's what you really want. She squeezed her eyes shut from the emotional pain when Hale didn't bother to deny that. He was clearly set on the course, having decided either that she wasn't his mate or that he didn't want a mate. Either way, she had a tough road ahead of her. It was going to be difficult to avoid the discussion when she wanted answers so badly, but he clearly needed more time to convalesce first. With a small sigh of exasperation, she went over to one of the hard plastic chairs and sat down on it as Hale closed his eyes, appearing to feign sleep rather than face her. It was a juvenile tactic, and she didn't know whether to laugh or slug him. In the end, she did neither. She simply sat and waited, which was unusual for her. Unusual or not, she was certain Hale was worth waiting for. Chapter 6 For the first time in a long time, Hale could hear his bear clearly in his mind, without the hint of haze that often left him feeling disconnected from that side of himself. Ever since Stone's people had kidnapped him, he'd felt the keen absence of his bear side, buried under far too many layers of drugs to be able to reach easily. His bear was a grumpy bastard, and it was Hale's own fault, at least according to the beast inside him. He shouldn't have tried to push Maya away. The bear was grousing at him for trying to unclaim their mate. He knew it was a futile task, but he didn't deserve her. The things he had done over the last few months were horrible enough, but the thing he had done to her was the absolute worst, and he would never be worthy to be her mate. She stood beside the bed now, looking exasperated and hurt. The expression in her eyes felt like it ripped his heart out of his chest and stomped on it, but he forced his expression to remain aloof, perhaps even a little stern. There's nothing to talk about. Yes, there is, said Maya. Liar! said his bear in his head, much more forcefully and far louder. He winced, trying to tamp down the bear a little bit. He had missed that part of himself, but right now, he wished his bear would shut the fuck up. We have a lot to talk about. I'm not leaving until we do. In the two days since he'd awakened in Doc Burrow's office, he had recovered rapidly enough to return to his cabin. He was still transforming a few times a day while needing to avoid overdoing it so he didn't expend too much energy. The doctor was encouraged by how quickly he was healing, guessing he would soon regain his full regenerative ability once his health was restored. He thought about telling her to get out of his cabin, but he knew his cousin Cade wouldn't enforce that even if he called to report her for trespassing. Cade would just laugh at him and tell him to work it out with his mate. He loved Cade, but his cousin was an asshole in the situation. She was glaring at him with her hands on her hips, and the way her chest was heaving let him know his lower body was functioning just fine. 
He was hard as a rock and aching for her, but reminding himself of what he'd done that night in the ring kept him from doing something impulsive, like getting out of the bed where he lay and pushing her onto the bed to kiss her forcefully. You said I was your mate, so what changed your mind? Were you just so drugged you didn't know what you were saying? It was the perfect excuse, and he almost seized it, but he held himself in check. He wasn't certain if she was testing him, or if that was a fear weighing heavily on her. If the latter was the case, he didn't want to make her feel worse by allowing her to believe it had been the drugs talking instead of him. With a sigh, he ran a hand through his black hair as he stared at her, allowing his frustration and a hint of the want inside to show. It wasn't the drugs, but you can't be my mate. She flinched as though he had slapped her. Why not? Am I not good enough? Am I too curvy for you? Is it because I'm not a shifter too? He tugged at his hair until his scalp stung, needing something to focus him. Damn it, Maya. It has nothing to do with you. Her mouth dropped open, and she looked like a fish out of water for just a second before she regained control. That's a stupid thing to say. It has everything to do with me. First you offer me this future, dangling it before me, and now you're trying to take it back? How can you say it has nothing to do with me? He sighed again, struggling to find the words. You deserve better. I don't deserve you. It's all me and has nothing to do with you. I'd be honored to have you as my mate, but I'm the one who's not good enough. She glared at him. What are you talking about? Hale shook his head. How can you not know? I spent the last few months fighting and killing my own kind, and then I did the worst thing of all. I violated my mate. She blinked, looking confused. Violated? You violated me? At his nod, she shook her head. You didn't violate me. I don't know what you are talking about. He glared at her. Now who's the one on drugs? Don't tell me you've forgotten that night in the ring when I pushed you against the wall and forced you to mate. Perhaps even more shamefully, I gave you the mating bite without a chance to decline. You must hate me. She laughed at him, though it wasn't a cruel sound. I don't hate you. I... I'm not in love with you, but I could easily see reaching that point. If you'd stop being so damn stubborn, we'd have a chance at really being mates. He slumped forward, putting his head in his hands, his elbows supported by the pillow on his lap. We can't do that. I've done something terrible to you, something completely taboo in our culture. You don't claim a mate without her permission. Though its intensity fades without regular bites, it's a permanent mark, and it wards off all other male shifters. If she doesn't want you, you've tainted her for others, too. He trailed off, squeezing his eyes shut in an attempt to abort the headache forming behind them. He breathed deeply, still not looking at her. I was under the influence of drugs that I didn't take, but that's no excuse for my behavior, and I don't deserve your forgiveness. I certainly don't deserve to have a mate like you after what I did to you. She let out a sigh. Look at me. Hale resisted for a moment, finding it easier to do what he had to do when he didn't have to see her, or the pain in her eyes. Doing the right thing was getting increasingly difficult, but he couldn't allow his resolve to falter. He'd already done enough terrible things, and he couldn't allow her to be hurt further, not when he could stop it if he could just control himself and his barren side, which was currently roaring at him to claim their mate again. Trying to block out the bear made it easier to ignore her until she spoke sharply. Open your eyes and look at me! With a small sigh, he forced himself to obey the command in her tone. He was about to say something, but he completely forgot what it was at the sight before him. His mate had shed her clothes, and she stood in her full, rounded, and glorious nudity before him. He groaned softly as his bear growled with possessive pleasure. He was in trouble, and his resolve was rapidly weakening. Maya tried to project an air of confidence in the face of his conflicted stare. She was uncertain about this course of action, but desperation drove her. She had to get through to him somehow before he decided to cling to his nobility and insist on freeing her while breaking both their hearts in the process. 
She couldn't think of a better way to get through to him as she moved closer, skirting around the edge of the bed while sashaying her hips. You're my mate. I'm yours. You told me that, and it's a promise I'm holding you to, Hale. He shook his head, still trying to fight his inner demons. That was clear from his expression and the way his eyes darkened. She wasn't certain which side was winning, but she was rooting for the bear, which seemed to want to forget all about the circumstances surrounding their first mating, and the bite he'd used to claim her, while his tortured human side insisted on dwelling upon it and punishing himself for something that wasn't his fault. You should go now. She shook her head as she put one knee on the bed. It was an encouraging sign when he didn't push her away, so she put her other knee on the bed, too, swinging one over and around to straddle his thighs. He groaned, but didn't try to push her away, either physically or verbally. He just closed his eyes, perspiration beating on his brow. You can't do this. You deserve better than me. I'm not worthy of a mate, especially one as perfect as you. She laughed softly. When you say things like that, I can't seem to help myself. I just want to kiss you, touch you, and... She bent her head, running her tongue up his abdomen, carefully skirting the much smaller bandage covering the area. He was healing more each day, but there was still evidence of the wound. He groaned as her tongue moved over his skin, letting out a small sound that could have meant anything, but was probably one of pleasure when she grazed her teeth across his nipple. A moment later, she reached her destination, and she held her breath for a moment before she buried her teeth into his shoulder in a light nip. It was a bit on the sharp side, and he yelped, his eyes flying open as she lifted her head to look at him. What are you doing? His bewilderment was clear. She smiled at him as the seductive upswing of her lips and ensured her voice emerged as a silken purr. I'm claiming you as my mate. That's how it's done, isn't it? Hale groaned. You can't do that, Maya. She frowned at him. Oh, are only the males allowed to bite their female mates? That seems pretty sexist. He rolled his eyes. You're not a shifter, so you aren't imparting pheromones that mark me as yours, at least not to the same extent or intensity. If we were mates, you could still mark me as much as you wanted. It's not a gender issue. It's just an issue of doing the right thing, and you deserve better than me. Exasperated, Maya slid higher up his body, brushing her wet folds against his hard erection. His mind was conflicted, but his body clearly wasn't. I know what I want, and you're plenty worthy to me. You're the only one blaming yourself for what's happened, and it's not right to push me away because you're hurting. I want to help you feel better and be with you, to stand by you and offer comfort when you need it. I know you're hurt, but pushing me away just hurts me too. Hale let out a ragged sigh. I just can't. He trailed off, looking lost. You can, she said firmly. Maya knew instinctively that if she let him push her away now, it would be even harder to break through his walls later. She didn't want to be rough on him, but she was convinced he needed her, perhaps even more than she needed him, and she refused to let him push her away out of a misguided sense of nobility. With that thought in mind, she aligned her opening with the head of his cock, preparing to take him inside her. Instead, in the blink of an eye, their positions had shifted. He had her pinned on the bed, having flipped her over with ease. She blinked up at him, confused about how quickly things had changed. No, you don't. If you're determined to do this, we're going to do it right. We're not rushed in front of an audience now. His voice was more of a gruff growl than a human timber, and it was hot enough to have burned through her panties if she was still wearing any. She nodded her head in compliance, having no wish to argue with that stipulation. If he wanted to spend hours on her body, she was more than happy to let him, as long as she had the same privilege. A second later, Hale bent his head and his mouth captured hers for a deep kiss. It was their first one, which was strange when she thought about it, since they had already had sex, but under the gentle onslaught of his mouth, she soon found it difficult to think about anything except for the next brush of his lips against hers or the stroke of his tongue as it coaxed the seam of her lips apart. She yielded, caressing his tongue with hers as it slipped into her mouth. 
Maya strained to get closer to him, wrapping her arms around his shoulders as his slipped around and under her body, pulling her soft flesh more tightly against his hard body. She let out a small sound of protest when his mouth broke away from hers, but it was simply so he could drift lower, nibbling his way over her chin and down her neck, his intent clear as he angled to the left, finally reaching her breast a moment later. She gasped and dug a hand into his hair when he encompassed the top bud into his wet mouth, sucking gently. She wanted to ensure he didn't leave, so she kept her hand lodged firmly in his hair, holding him against her. It felt divine to have his mouth touching her that way, and when he moved away, she would have whimpered if she'd been capable of speech. Fortunately, he was simply switching his attention to her other breast, repeating the gentle motions of his lips and mouth as his hands cupped the one he had just left, fingers twirling gently around her nipple. By the time his mouth drifted down her abdomen, ghosting over her belly button before reaching her mound, she was a sodden, sobbing mess. She needed him with an intensity she had never known before, and half of her wanted to demand he skip his next destination and simply bury his cock inside her, because only it would satisfy her. The other half of her wanted to feel his lips on her and his tongue inside her most intimate place. There was something intensely bonding about the act, so she didn't register a protest when he settled between her thighs, fingers splaying her folds to give his mouth room to work. She quickly decided he was good at his job, his tongue and lips teasing her and coaxing her into a fevered state. The appendage stroked down her folds, seeming to find every little niche that felt anywhere from good to amazing. When he found the amazing spots, he seemed to take care to memorize them, returning over and over again to those areas. Considering how talented his tongue was, she shouldn't have been surprised when she came with a small cry, seemingly seconds after he had started his passionate ministrations. He reacted with a small chuckle, temporarily easing the intensity of his touch, but not letting up. His continued attention drew out the pleasure of her orgasm, and she had barely finished coming the first time when he brought her to a renewed pitch, inducing a second orgasm. It was clear he planned to repeat the pattern, so she summoned all her strength, both emotional and physical, to get his attention. It would have been marvelous to just simply slip into the pleasure his mouth offered, to lose herself in the sensations, but she needed more. She tried gently to pull his head away, but he resisted, either because he was enjoying his location, or he was determined to get her off again. Either way, she wanted him elsewhere, so she tugged more forcefully on his hair. With the smothered oath, he lifted his head. Proof of her arousal made his face shiny, and he looked torn between exasperation and intense need. I'm kind of busy here. What do you need? In spite of her determination and her plans to focus strictly on instructing him about what she really wanted, she found herself giggling. I'm sorry to bother you in the middle of work. He winked at her. It's hardly work when you love it this much. As his head started to lower, she jerked gently on his hair again, forcing his gaze back to hers. As much as I love your mouth, there's another part of you I'd rather have between my legs at the moment. He tipped his head slightly to the side, as though considering her words. Is it my... knee? She giggled at him again, surprised by the playful side of him. As morose as he was, and after the trauma he'd suffered, it was nice to see a bit of carefree fun from him. Higher. He frowned in concentration. My chin? She shook her head. Lower. With a sexy grin, he asked. Is it my cock? She nodded. Bingo. He laughed, too, and it was a rich, full sound. It was the first time she'd heard him express any amusement, and the deep, rich sound made bubbles of excitement fizz in her stomach, even as it increased her need for him to a new level. That's a different game, Maya. She let all hint of amusement fade, needing him to believe her sincerity as she captured his gaze with hers. I'm not playing any games, Hale. I need you. His amusement fled, and his own desire clearly took over. He lifted her thighs in both his hands, rearranging her to his liking and pulling her off the pillow at the same time. She let out a startled yelp, but there was no pain in it and no fear. 
It must have reassured him that she was just fine with everything because he didn't slow down or pause in his actions. He spread her legs as wide as they would go as he got on his knees, angling forward so that the shaft could find her liquid heat. They cried out together when he surged inside her less than a second later, settling fully into her sheath and making her tremble under the force of the pleasure he evoked. He stayed inside her, buried as deeply as he could, for a long moment as their gazes locked. Slowly, he began to ease out of her before sliding in again. She matched his rhythm, which stayed slow and careful for a long time. Time itself ceased to exist as they shared their own private world, lost in each other's eyes as their bodies moved in tandem, gradually building closer to the point of an intense release. It seemed to happen slowly, though, and she was almost startled when she contracted around him, feeling his cock twitch in sympathy as their orgasms began. In contrast to the slow, gentle pace they had maintained, the orgasm swept over her like a raging inferno, making her entire body tingle and causing her to gasp several times as she tried to breathe under the force of her release. She had never come like that in her life, and to feel him inside her, obviously undergoing the same intense release, simply fueled her own. Time had lost all meaning, so she wasn't certain how long she orgasmed, but it felt like hours as they held each other, though she was certain it couldn't have been more than a minute or two at the most. When the last wave of pleasure had crested and waned, he still held her tightly against him, their bodies fused as they turned on their sides to face each other. He pressed a tender kiss to her forehead, and she squeezed his hip, uncertain when her hand had arrived at that destination. He spoke first. Thank you. Her eyes widened. I think I should be the one thanking you. That was the most amazing, intense lovemaking of my life. Mine, too. The words were gruff, but the tone was tender. He kissed her again, this time gently on the lips, before wrapping his arms around her and securing her tightly against him. It didn't take long at all before his breathing deepened and evened out, indicating he had fallen asleep. She supposed she should get up, take a shower, and do something productive. None of that sounded appealing, so she allowed herself to listen to him breathe, enjoying the feel of his arms around her as she clung to him, and though she hadn't anticipated falling asleep, she realized sometime later that her eyes were heavy and she allowed them to close. They spent the next two days mostly in bed, other than the times he got up to shift, hoping to increase his healing ability. He seemed to have better control and a smaller wound every time he made the transition, and Dr. Burrow had told him he was optimistic that once the drugs cleared his system, he would be returned to his usual metabolic state. On the morning of the third day, after they had first become mates at her instigation, though that certainly wasn't the only time they had made it since then, he shifted before breakfast, and when he shifted back, the wound was entirely gone. Maya let out a small gasp of surprise, though it was a silly reaction. She had seen it shrinking during the intervening days, but it was still somewhat startling to look at his perfectly smooth skin now and see no sign that he had been shot. She examined him from head to toe for a moment, looking for any signs of trauma, but his skin was smooth and unmarred. That's an amazing ability. I wish I had it. It is amazing, but not as amazing as you. He followed up his words by putting his arm around her and capturing her mouth for a deep kiss. Things had just started to get really interesting when he abruptly pushed her away, though gently. She frowned at him in confusion. What? My sense of smell tells me the bacon is about to burn, and that would be a tragedy. His eyes twinkled as he spoke. She pulled away from his arms and turned back to the stove, quickly rescuing the bacon before it went from crispy to burned. The eggs were ready a moment later, and she watched with genuine amusement as he wolfed down his breakfast before reaching for seconds. I guess healing takes a lot out of you. He nodded, too busy eating to respond. Now that you're fully healed, I guess I can't keep you confined to bed all day. She really was sorry to see that need flee in the face of his recovery. She wouldn't trade him getting better for it, though, since it was good to see him whole and vital again. Now he could move on. 
Hopefully that didn't include moving on without her, though she didn't think it did. The last few days had been all about the two of them, but for the first time since she had claimed him as her mate, she started having doubts again. Now that he was healed, would he change his mind and turn away from her? Would he send her back to Seattle now that he no longer needed her? She hoped that was simply an irrational fear, because he hadn't really needed her the last few days either, no more than she had needed him anyway. Forcing herself to ask, because she needed to know, even if she didn't like the answer, she asked, What now? His answer surprised her. Now I go talk with the others, and we plan a raid on that island. The shifters still being held there need to be rescued, and that entire operation has to be shut down. I can't wait for Javier Calderon to find his brother and destroy his little island empire. The shifters would probably be killed in such a scenario anyway. Shock coursed through her. You mean you're planning to go back there? At his nod of confirmation, she started shaking her head. You can't do that. It's too dangerous. You were lucky to escape the first time. You might not make it off that island if you go back. His mouth was firm. The others we left behind certainly won't make it off the island if we don't try to rescue them. She frowned. Are they even part of your tribe? Clan, he corrected. Except for Alex, they aren't part of the clan on Bear Island, but they're my people now. We shared an experience so ugly and intense that it can't help but change you and bind you to the people involved. I'm lucky I didn't have to kill any of the ones left behind. His expression darkened. With Alex still there, and he certainly is part of the Bear Island clan, I'll really be able to rally support for the others to rescue him. It won't be a one-person operation, he winked at her. Or should I say, a one-bear operation. She was too worried about him and his mission to find any humor in the situation. If you know all about Calderon's brother, and I'm still fuzzy on those details, why don't you just call him? He laughed softly, though it wasn't a mocking sound. I'm afraid I don't happen to have the phone number for the leader of the largest drug cartel in Mexico. I don't know all the details myself, but I overheard enough in captivity to piece together some of it. They're amazingly lax with their topics of discussion when we're drugged, thinking we were more insensate than we were. Well, what do you know? She was still pinning her hopes on somehow contacting Javier Calderon, thus negating the necessity for Hale to feel compelled to rescue the remaining bear shifters on that island. He shrugged. From what I pieced together, Luis ripped off his brother, who used to be his partner. He disappeared with a couple of billion dollars from their drug sales, and he's hiding out from his brother to avoid losing his money and his life. Like I said, I didn't pick up a lot, I just managed to piece that much together during the months I was stuck in that cage. Stone liked to gossip like an old lady, and Guillermo was just as bad. I have a contact, the one who told me about Bear Island to start with. He might know how to get a hold of Javier Calderon, or at least send us in the right direction. Let's try that and let him handle his brother. Then no one here has to risk their life. His expression closed, indicating he wasn't open to that idea. It's likely Javier will come in with guns blazing, and he won't care who gets killed in the crossfire as long as he takes out Luis. I can't risk that. She glared at him. I don't want to risk you either. Hale's expression looked grim, and he was clearly feeling tortured. After everything I've done, it's the only way I can think to make amends. I have to get my people out of there. What happened wasn't your fault, and you need to stop blaming yourself. With a small roar, he pushed away from the table so quickly she barely saw the motion. He was on his feet as the chair crashed to the floor, his chest heaving and his eyes wild. I have killed my own kind. I couldn't stop myself, and I couldn't regain control. I can't live with myself if I leave the others behind. You won't be able to live with me either, because I can't let go of what happened. My mind dwells on it. The only time I'm not thinking about what happened and the things I did is when I'm inside you. We can't spend all our time in bed, so if you are determined to be my mate, I have to do this. I have to do it for myself, and I need to do it for you, too. I need your support. 
She bit her lip, searching for another argument that she couldn't seem to discover. With a sigh, she nodded. If I lose you, I won't survive it either. You have to come back to me. His posture remained rigid, and his words were less than encouraging. I'll do what I can, but I have to see the others freed. It's the only way I'll ever feel worthy of the freedom I regained, and having you as a mate. Otherwise, I'll become trapped in my own bitterness, and there's no way we can make a future work under those circumstances. It felt like emotional blackmail, though she was certain he didn't mean it that way. Hale, no doubt, was simply telling her the way he felt, and she tried to interpret it that way, rather than allowing her own filters to distort what she was hearing. It was still difficult not to feel betrayed that he would risk their future on a rescue mission when someone else was available to take down Luis Calderon. She couldn't understand exactly what he'd been through because it was his unique experience, but she thought it was clouding his judgment. I just need you to promise you'll come back. He let out a ragged sigh. I can't promise that. Another moment passed and he didn't speak. His eyes blinked and he looked away from her. I'm going to talk to Cade and the others to figure out a plan. I'll be back. She watched him go, not speaking either. She was torn by the hurt she felt at him being willing to risk his life, despite it being inexorably intertwined with hers now, even as empathy forced her to see his point of view. If she had been in his position, she couldn't have turned her back on the remaining captives either. Even not being in his position, the idea was intolerable, and she was certain they needed to be freed. She just didn't want it to be her mate who risked his life to do so. The door of the cabin closed behind him a few moments later, and she didn't wait much longer past him. Once he'd been gone a few minutes, she got to her feet, quickly tidied the kitchen, and left the cabin. The only place she knew for sure where she could find a working phone was in the sheriff's office, so she headed in that direction. She was hoping to time it just right so that Calderon could bring down his brother, and Hale wouldn't need to mount a rescue mission. If he had to step foot on that island at all, she hoped it would simply be to extract bear shifters being held there. If the others were engaged with fighting Calderon's people, or he had already decimated them, it would make Hale's mission a lot easier she hoped. The sheriff's office was unlocked, and she slipped inside, letting out a relieved sigh when she saw the building was empty. She hoped there was some kind of meeting somewhere else, imagining Hale was laying out his plan at the moment. It would keep them occupied for a while, and there'd be no one to tell her she couldn't try to reach Javier Calderon. It was dangerous, but no more dangerous than allowing her mate and his people to storm an island where they were heavily guarded with machine guns, ruled by death, but had no regard for any kind of life, and wouldn't hesitate to kill them all or enslave any of the survivors. With those thoughts in mind, her first call was to Susie Hanlon, who was a member of Hand and Paw, and the one who had brought James to the meeting so that he could tell them about the bear fights. From Susie, she got James's number, and she dialed it seconds after hanging up with her friend. The phone rang three times, and she was almost anticipating going straight to voicemail, grimacing at the possibility, when he finally answered. Yeah. James McCoy? His voice became guarded. Who wants to know? My name is Maya Colson, and we met at a hand and paw meeting. You wanted us to stop the bear fights. There was a hint of relief in his tone when he spoke. Yeah, I remember the meeting. I also remember your group decided not to do nothing because it would cost too much money to get into the fights. We changed our minds. He didn't really need to hear all the details. We made it onto the island, and we realized it was run by Louis Calderon. He had a falling out with his brothers a few years ago, didn't he? Yeah, a falling out is one way to put it. What does it matter, Maya? I want to tell Javier where to find Luis. I was hoping you'd have his number. James laughed, though the sound held no amusement. I don't have his phone number. I'm not enmeshed in cartel business. She didn't doubt that, and it was unlikely his involvement with the cartel extended beyond gambling, perhaps owing them money and maybe a drug habit. The last part was just speculation. You have some dubious contacts, so you might be able to point me in the right direction. Just give me a lead. With a smothered sigh, he said, Jennings Brooks. 
He reeled off the phone number almost more quickly than she could write it down, slowed as she was by the necessity of taking a pen from an organizer on the desk and writing on a post-it. She repeated the number back to him. Is that right? Yeah, that's all I know. Don't call me again unless it's with the good news that you managed to stop the bear fights. If all goes as planned, I'm sure your gambling debt will be settled. The words were snarkier than she had intended, but his attitude annoyed her. He'd planned to use their animal rights group as a way to get out of his gambling debts. She didn't feel like she owed him anything, especially the news of Calderon's downfall, should it come about. After hanging up, she called the number he'd given her, and gently, but insistently, wearing down that man's defenses until he gave her another number and another name. Five names and calls later, she reached a contact identified simply as Alejandro. You don't know me, but I need to speak with Javier Calderon. I was given your number as a way to find him. There was silence on the other end for a moment before Alejandro spoke. I don't know who this is. But you don't call this number and goof around, puta. I'm not goofing around. I need to tell your boss where he can find Luis Calderon. Please let me speak to him. No, said the man firmly. Disappointment surged through her, but she wasn't going to be defeated just yet. Are you telling me he doesn't want to know where Luis is? I'm telling you, I am not authorized to put you through. Give me the information and I'll pass it along to him. I want to speak to him myself. He let out a sharp bark of laughter. That's not happening. If you really want to leave a message for him, you leave it with me. If it's good enough, I'll relay it to him. That is as close as you get to Javier. She bit off a sigh of impatience, knowing it would do her no good to utter it. A glance at the clock revealed she'd already been engaged with this task for too long. If Hale had called a meeting of the other shifters on the island, surely it would be wrapping up soon. She knew he didn't want Javier involved, so she wanted to complete this task before that meeting ended. Fine. She gave him as much information as she could, not entirely certain of the location of the island, but hoping it would point him in the right direction. Will Javier be going after Luis? If your intel checks out, I'm sure he will. He's eager to see his brother again. There was an ominous note in Alejandro's voice. A shiver went down her spine, and she was glad she wasn't the one being hunted by Javier. No wonder Luis had gone to ground, clearly frightened of his brother with good reason. There are some hostages being held in cages there. Please tell Senor Calderon that they are not to be harmed. Alejandro sounded amused when he spoke. Are you trying to issue an order to Javier? She bit her lip, trying to find a suitable way to phrase it. Yes, I am. The people in the cages are innocent, so they should be taken care of and not injured. Will you tell Senor Calderon what I said? I'll tell him, Senorita, but I don't know if he'll comply. Anger surged in her, and she was certain it reflected in her tone. The people in those cages are the most important things on that island, and Calderon needs to take care of them. She didn't have an opportunity to find out the resolution to the conversation, because the phone suddenly hung up. In the corner of her eye, she saw a muscular arm reaching forward to press the cradle, ending the call. Swallowing the lump in her throat, she turned to face Cade Lassiter, intimidated by the anger on his face. What? She didn't get a chance to finish the question. Cade ripped the phone from her hand and slammed it down into the cradle. He glowered at her and gripped her bicep, dragging her from the desk toward the only cell in the one-room jailhouse. How could you betray him like that? She tried to tug free. I wasn't. I'm trying to save Hale. He shouldn't go back to that island. None of you should. It's obvious you're protecting your boss, not the man who thinks he's your mate. Do you have any idea how it's going to destroy him when he finds out you deceived him? Tears came to her eyes and she blinked them away. I'm not trying to betray him. I'm trying to save him. I got a message through to Senor Calderon. He sneered at her. Yes, I heard. You warned him to guard the shifters because we're coming to rescue them. Her mouth dropped open and she shook her head. That wasn't what you heard. His eyes sparkled with anger. 
That's exactly what I heard. Fortunately, you didn't know the details of our plan, so you weren't able to give specifics. I'm going to lock you in here where you can stay out of trouble and out of our way until we get to the island and back. If some of us don't come back, that's squarely on you for issuing a warning to Calderon. If you just listen... He glared at her. I don't need to listen to you. I heard everything already. You betrayed your mate and all of us. It's up to Hale whatever happens to you, but I'm going to suggest he banish you. You can't be trusted. She glared at him. You're a narrow-minded jerk, Sheriff Lassiter. You won't listen to the truth, so why bother wasting my time on you? Send Hale to me, and I'll talk to him. He'll understand. He turned away from her, barely taking time to answer as he walked to the door. There's no time to send for Hale at the moment. We're heading for the island later today, and there are details to plan. In the meantime, I know you're out of trouble, or at least out of the way of causing trouble. Hale will be occupied with formulating our rescue plan, and he won't have time to listen to your lies until it's over. No, you can't let him go. None of you should go. At the door, Cade turned to face her before he walked away. I couldn't stop Hale from going if I wanted to. He needs to know the others are safe and free from the island, or he's never going to be able to move on or get over what happened to him. As his mate, you should understand that, but I don't think you're ready to be his mate. It's too bad for him that his bear identified a traitor as his mate. He's going to be devastated, perhaps even more devastated by losing you than what he's been through for the last few months. Without another word, the sheriff disappeared through the door, closing it behind him and locking it a moment later. She wanted to continue to shout at him and yell for him to let her out and to listen to her explanation, but she knew it was futile. With a small sigh, she moved away from the bars and over to the cot in the corner, sitting down on it. She eyed the cell dubiously, surprised to find it scrupulously clean. Perhaps there wasn't much call for its use, maybe aside from acting as a drunk tank upon occasion. It was surprisingly comfortable, and she tried to settle in for a long wait, racking her brain to think of some way to escape, or at least get attention. If she could get someone to listen, they would get Hale, and he would listen to her. Eventually, she hoped. Chapter 7 Hale stepped out of the water, shivering slightly at the cool temperature, though his shifter metabolism made it a little more than slightly unpleasant. All around him, his brethren stepped out of the strait as well, having swum the last distance from where they had left the boat anchored to remain out of sight of the island. Once everyone stood together on the shores, no one bothering with clothing so they could slip easily back and forth between their bear and human forms, they enacted the next stage of their plan. The group broke in half, all without speaking, and each approaching different sides of the island. Hale, flanked by Cade, his uncles Wyatt and Ben, and Wyatt's daughter, Poppy, moved quietly through the island, not wanting to betray their presence until it was necessary. It wasn't long before they came across a guard detail, and Cade and Hale slipped into their bear forms, quickly dealing with the two men and taking the machine guns they carried. He handed his to Poppy after returning to his human form. Do you know how to handle that? She shrugged. You press a button and it shoots bullets? Trigger, corrected Wyatt, clapping his daughter lightly on the shoulder. It's pretty much idiot-proof. She shot him a sour look. Thanks, Dad. Hale let their quiet teasing wash over him, enjoying the moment of normalcy amid the strangeness of being back on this island. At least this time, he was the aggressor, not the captive. His sole goal was to free the bear shifters and destroy this place so that Calderon couldn't rebuild. If that meant killing Calderon and Stone, he would do so, though killing anyone, even those two, held no appeal. They moved on, dispatching other guards in their path until they all ended up armed, though so far they hadn't needed to fire any shots. They were hoping to keep it that way as long as possible to remain a stealth presence on the island. Finally, they reached the enclosure where the shifters were held captive. He was dismayed to see six of the eight cages now filled, meaning Stone had detected other shifters and managed to kidnap them. At least maybe they were liberating them before these shifters had to fight to the death. 
Luckily enough, Stone himself was in his lab, as Hale discovered, when he slipped through the other opening, ensuring the building was secure, while others freed the shifters in cages. When he saw Stone standing at his microscope, a rumble of satisfaction issued from his throat. The sound alerted the scientist, who looked up just in time to see Hale looming over him. He grabbed hold of the other man, his hands wrapped tightly around his larynx so the human couldn't scream, at least not audibly. Thoughts of revenge and inflicting pain ran through his mind, and he was torn between taking the time to draw out Stone's death and the need to hurry before Calderon realized his island was under attack and fortified himself inside the mansion. He looked up at the sound of shuffling feet, wincing when he saw Alex step through the doorway. His friend looked rough, though they now knew he would probably heal quickly once the drugs completely left his system. In the meantime, he was in for a long few days, even without a gunshot, as Hale had suffered from. He's mine, said Alex with a growl, baring his teeth. Hale had no reason to argue with that, not really caring who ended Stone's experiments, as long as they were a permanent solution. His only concern was Alex's state of health. Are you up for this? Swaying slightly, Alex squared his shoulders in a determined fashion, and his gaze was predatory when it rested on the scientist, who whimpered and tried to pull himself free of Hale's hold on his throat. I'm up for it. Taking his friend at his word, Hale dragged the scientist closer to Alex and thrust the other man at him. Stone spoke in an annoyingly high squeak. You can't do this! I'm just trying to advance science! Hale didn't hear his friend's response as he slipped from the lab, moving rapidly, though he did hear Stone screams less than a minute later. So much for stealth. With a resigned sigh, he dropped the gun and slipped into his bear form before he began to run as fast as he could, narrowing in on the mansion, where he was certain he would find Calderon. His senses were alert, and he realized halfway to the house that Calderon wasn't there. Rather, he could smell the man's scent from a different direction, and he hurried that way, veering with little effort as he continued running full tilt. Somehow, Calderon must have realized they were on the island. He must have cameras or some sort of heat sensors. However he had detected them, he was close to escaping, and Hale couldn't allow that to happen. Calderon stood near the water, barking orders at two security guards who were currently prepping a small sailboat. It seemed like an unlikely getaway vessel, which was perhaps why Calderon had chosen it. He increased his pace, pushing himself to his limits as he ran and roared at Calderon simultaneously. He had a surge of satisfaction when the other man turned and looked at him with an expression of raw terror on his face. He chuckled in amusement, though it came out more of a grumbly growl in his bare form, when he saw the two guards suddenly take off in the boat, not waiting for their boss, and clearly not willing to put themselves between Calderon and one pissed-off bear. With a bleat of terror, Calderon turned and ran toward the water, perhaps planning to swim to the boat, or just panicking and not having a plan. Either way, he barely made it a few feet into the water before Hale hooked his claws into Calderon's jacket and dragged him back onto the shore. He shoved him forcefully down to the ground and planted one paw on him. It encompassed the man's stomach and part of his chest, and though he struggled, he wasn't going anywhere. Hale let all the hatred he felt for the man swell in him, and he raked his claws down Calderon's side, making the man scream. He was lightly disturbed by his own need to torture and inflict pain on the man, even though Calderon had done the same to him and his fellow shifters. He wasn't sure he wanted to sink to that level, even if it meant Calderon received a taste of his own treatment toward others. In his bear form, his hearing was even better than it was in his human form, and he could hear the thump-thump-thump of helicopter blades before the vessel was in sight. Still keeping a firm hold on Calderon, he quickly shifted back to his human form as he waited for the helicopter to come into sight. He glared down at Calderon. Are these your reinforcements? Calderon shook his head. Spare me. He glared at him as he put his foot on the other man's throat, keeping him pinned to the ground. I should kill you right now. He couldn't even explain to himself why he was hesitating, other than he recalled the horror of how it felt to end a life. It was true that the people he'd been forced to kill over the last few months had been like him, and none of them had deserved to die. This man clearly deserved everything coming to him, but Hale was uncertain about being the one to give it to him. 
On the other hand, he couldn't hand off the task to others, and his opportunity was rapidly dwindling when the helicopter came into sight, finding them with a searchlight. He cursed as he started to press his foot harder on Calderon's throat, determined to end him before the helicopter could land. Hale needed to slip away and change form once he was out of sight, since Calderon had more people arriving on the island. He looked up in surprise when he saw a bullhorn emerging from the helicopter as it got closer to the ground. The speaker said something in Spanish, which was a language Hale didn't speak. He tried to infer the meaning, but even his enhanced sight couldn't allow him to make out the speaker's expression to help glean any clues to his intent. Calderon started struggling again, and Hale first assumed it was an attempt to escape so he could go to his people. It was only when the sharp tang of urine reached his nose that he realized the other man had pissed himself, clearly from fear. He hadn't been that afraid even when Hale was in bear form, and curiosity made him hesitate. He lifted his foot slightly, which allowed the other man to draw in a few breaths and rasp a few words. Kill me now before Javier can. It won't be rapid if he gets hold of me. He jerked in surprise at the sound of Calderon's brother's name, confused how Javier had found the location, but understanding his sudden fear. He chuckled at the idea. Your brother will torture you and make you suffer for stealing from him, won't he? See, si. said Calderon, his voice more accented than usual in his terror. Excellent. Hale bent down, not moving his foot until he had a hand wrapped around Calderon's lapels and another one around the back of his neck. He jerked the man to his feet and shoved him ahead of him as the helicopter touched down on the ground. He remained impassive when three Hispanic men jumped out of the helicopter, aiming machine guns at them. He held up the hand he'd been using to secure Calderon's lapels in a gesture of semi-surrender. You'll have no fight from me. A man around Calderon's age slipped from the helicopter with surprising grace. He was dressed just as pretentiously as Luis, but he seemed to wear it better. Perhaps it was because he wasn't plastered with his own urine. Hale snorted back a laugh at the thought. Now wasn't the time to give in to his amusement. The man he presumed was Javier Calderon approached, straightening his jacket and flicking off an invisible speck of something as he neared them. Hello, Luis he said in a cultured voice, sounding civilized and reasonable. It's been far too long, El Hermano. Hale was certain the polite exterior was a front, a facade behind which the head of the cartel held his deadly nature, but he had to make sure before surrendering Calderon. He looked at the other man, catching his gaze. Are you here to make Luis suffer? Javier nodded, his cold smile touching his lips. Suffer and die. Are you going to defend him? Hale snorted. Not likely. With a forceful shove against the other man's neck, he sent Luis flying in Javier's direction. One of the guards intercepted him before he could fall or crash into his brother, forcing Luis to his knees. Hale was certain of Calderon's fate, and he didn't need to stay around to witness it. He turned and walked away, not really surprised when Javier didn't try to call him back or question him further. Luis was the focus of his brother's anger, and Javier likely couldn't care less who Hale was as long as he didn't stand in the way of punishing Luis for his betrayal. As soon as he was out of their sight, he transformed back to his bear form and broke into a run, heading for the rendezvous point where they had all come ashore. There might be some guards left alive, but the two main players in this setup were dead, or about to be, so the minions were unlikely to be able to rebuild their shifter-fighting empire somewhere else. He found the others waiting for him, and he met the gaze of a shifter who had been on the other team. Did you destroy all the files? He asked Caleb. Caleb nodded, jerking his head in the direction of a plume of smoke rising in the air, accompanied by the crackling of flames. That building will burn to the ground, and the fire will likely spread to the house, though we found nothing in there that seemed to pertain to us or other shifters. I think it's safe to say Stone was holding all the data in his laboratory. Hale nodded. That makes sense. Calderon was a criminal, not a scientist. He probably wouldn't have understood most of the data anyway, so I'm sure Stone only imparted what he had to. And he won't be imparting anything to anyone anymore, Alex said as he cracked his knuckles. 
Hale glanced at them, seeing the blood smeared across them, and certain it wasn't Alex's. He nodded his understanding, relieved to know Alex had been able to follow through with his intention, whereas Hale felt slightly weak for not being the one to end Calderon. Was it weak to be sick of killing, to not be able to imagine ending another life, no matter how richly deserved the death? He didn't think so, but his bear was growling softly inside him, clearly discontent with the human side that had prompted him to make that decision. He made a soothing sound, knowing his bear would settle down. He was still getting reacquainted with that side of himself, having been cut off from his bear for so long for the last few months, and it felt like they were at odds with each other. It reminded him of how it had been going through puberty, when he first became aware of his bear side as another voice inside his head, his instincts suddenly having the ability to overwhelm his intellect. He was certain he and his bear would reconcile and find peace with each other, but it was part of the healing process. If he had killed Calderon, it would have simply prolonged that process, rather than hasten the reintegration. He tried to shove aside the thoughts as they moved into the water, swimming back to the boat as silently as possible in their human forms, just in case Javier had more people arriving on the island. The last thing they wanted to do was to alert another Calderon to existence of bear shifters. If for some reason Luis decided to confide in his brother about what he'd been doing here, assuming he was still alive to do so, Hale was certain Javier would believe his brother was either mad or lying, but he wouldn't put any stock in the idea of humans shifting into bears and vice versa. All the evidence to support the claim was destroyed and the shifters were freed. They had little to worry about, and he was certain Luis Calderon would be nothing but an unpleasant memory by morning. Once they were back in the boat and headed toward Bear Island, he allowed Cade to pull him aside, expecting his friend to interrogate him about Calderon's death or Javier's arrival. Instead, his words were a total shock. I hate to be the one to tell you this, but I caught Maya calling Calderon before we left today. She's been locked in a cell so I could keep her out of trouble, but she must have gotten the warning through, which was how they knew we were coming. His bear roared in his head, angry at the idea of their mate betraying them, and for a blinding moment he felt the bear's rage as his own. They were united in their reaction. He shouldn't have been surprised to find he couldn't trust her, because he had learned rapidly as Calderon's prisoner that he couldn't trust anyone. To know that his own mate had betrayed him that way was a new level of torment, though, and he growled his anger, feeling his control start to slip as the bear tried to emerge. Falling his hands into fists, he breathed deeply until he had reined in the impulse to shift in the boat. There would probably be enough room on the deck, but he didn't want to surrender to the impulse. He was trying to regain control of all of his emotions and become the more logical, centered man he had been before Stone's people had taken him. He didn't want to live at the mercy of his animal instincts, and he knew he had to regain control before he saw Maya again. He nodded at Cade, both as thanks for the warning and to indicate he had regained control. His cousin moved away, and Hale moved to the railing of the boat, staring broodingly at the waters of the strait below. Anger still thrummed in him, but he was making a conscious effort to react in a measured fashion, rather than with blinding rage. He couldn't imagine circumstances in which it was okay for her to betray him, but perhaps she had felt some sort of motivation that he didn't know about. Maybe Calderon had leverage over her, like her family. He didn't know, and he was hoping he could keep his anger in check long enough to find out her reasons before he decided how to react. When the door to the sheriff's office finally opened later that evening, she was still pacing, and she jerked to a halt at the sight of Hale entering the room rather than Cade. Let me out of here! He walked toward her, his muscles visibly clenched, and the anger radiated from him. He held a ring of keys in his hand, but made no move to open the door just yet. Cade told me why you're locked up. I called Calderon. He scowled at her. Why would you do that? What possible reason could you have for betraying us? Her anger was rapidly rising, but she took a moment to regain control, trying not to let the frustration of having been locked in the cell all day unfairly make her unload on Hale when Kate was the one who had misinterpreted what she was doing. 
I called Calderon, Javier Calderon, because I was trying to help. I hoped he would deal with Luis and his people, and you could get the shifters out before anyone discovered their presence. I tried to tell Cade that, but your cousin is a stubborn ass and won't listen to anyone. I hope you're not just like him. He hesitated for a long second, clearly debating about whether he believed her or not. She tried not to let it irritate her that he hadn't immediately embraced the truth of her words. They didn't know each other as well as they would, just yet, and he knew Kate better than she did. It would have been natural for him to trust his cousin over her, at least in her world. She wasn't sure how the mate thing influenced his perceptions in his culture, and he'd certainly been through enough hell for the last few months to be suspicious of everyone. After what seemed like an eternity, he slipped the key in the lock and opened the cell door a moment later. I'm sorry. I should have listened to your side. Relief swept through her, and she slipped out of the cell and threw herself into his arms. It was Cade who should have listened, not you. I don't blame you for being doubtful. I think you were wrong not to want to involve Javier from the start, and I did go around your decision on that, so feel free to be angry with me. But please, no, I didn't betray you, and I wouldn't do anything to hurt you. She cupped his face in her hands, staring intently into his eyes. You're my mate, and it's my job to take care of you. He laughed softly. I think that's my line. I'm supposed to take care of you. She rolled her eyes at his chauvinism. Why don't we just agree to take care of each other? He looked doubtful, and she tried not to let it hurt, uncertain if he was doubting her or simply her ability to take care of him. Are you positive you want to be my mate? The uncertainty in his voice cut through her, and she released her hands from his face to wrap around his neck, holding him as tightly as she could. I'm certain. I'm absolutely positively sure I want to be with you. Don't ever doubt that. He had buried his head in her hair, which muffled his words. I'm trying not to. I'm not going to be easy to live with. I have things to deal with and a lot of pain ahead of me. I don't want to hurt you in the process. All she could do was hold him as tightly as she could while she pressed a kiss to his bare chest. Let me take care of you. Trust me to do that, and trust me to know that I'm where I want to be. She knew she was asking a lot from him, since he'd been through something that made it difficult to trust anyone. It was the only way she was going to make it with him, though. He had to be able to trust her enough to at least bring his bad moments to her along with the good ones. His arms tightened fractionally, though it should have been impossible for him to get her any closer. I do trust you. It's myself I don't trust. I don't want to hurt you, either physically or emotionally. You trust me, and I trust you not to do that. Some of the tension fled his body, and she snuggled closer at the sign of acceptance from him. She was certain it would be a rough road ahead, at least for a while, but she was determined to stay by his side and help her bear fight through the biggest battle of his life. He wouldn't be healed overnight, and he was bound to doubt both himself and her, but all she could do was remain at his side and show him she was trustworthy, and they were both worth fighting for. Epilogue The harsh winter had given way to a beautiful spring, and she lay on a blanket as she waited for Hale to join her. He was taking a swim in the cold water, which he claimed was invigorating. To her strictly human metabolism, it was a freezing cold ice bath, and she had declined the invitation to join him. That would require a wetsuit, and there was no way one was going to fit over her burgeoning belly. Instead, she chose to remain on the blanket, wrapped in a light throw, as she waited for her mate to finish his morning swim. They had gotten up early because he wanted to hit the water, and she couldn't sleep in her uncomfortable state. As far along as she was, it was difficult to find a comfortable position to sleep more than an hour or two. So she might as well be uncomfortable with a beautiful sunrise and her mate instead of tossing and turning in their large bed, which was normally comfortable, except for now. He emerged from the water, a sleek black form, as he shook off the water from his fur before transforming back to his human form. She tossed him a towel as he got closer, and he dried off before joining her on the blanket. 
He wrapped his arms around her, and she squealed at his cold skin, but he showed no mercy. He kept her against him as his skin warmed up, or she grew accustomed to his cold temperature. She wasn't really fighting to get away anyway, because despite the coldness, there was nowhere else she wanted to be but in his arms. He leaned back against a tree, holding her back against his chest as his hand settled on her tummy. He rubbed lightly, and the baby rewarded him with a kick against his palm. It made him chuckle, and a sound of delight filled her with warmth that countered the coldness of his skin. He was definitely in a better frame of mind than he had been a few months ago, and she was certain the baby had a lot to do with that. There were nights when he still woke from nightmares, but they were far less frequent now. Laughs were coming quicker to his lips, and there was a joy in his expression again. He was letting go of the past and focusing on their future together as a family. He was clearly excited to meet their cub, and as another contraction clenched her stomach, she was certain he would have a chance later that day. She hadn't yet told him she was in labor, but she would soon. For the moment, she was enjoying their last few hours together as just Maya and Hale, before they became mom and dad. She was excited for the future, but she was also enjoying the present. I love you, Hale. She said, softly she laid her head against his shoulder in a more comfortable fashion. I love you too, Maya. He seemed absolutely certain of that, as though he had never entertained any doubts to the contrary. He sounded calm, serene, and completely unshakable. She could fix that last part in seconds. Her lips twitched as she prepared for his reaction. Hale? Yes, love? I'm in labor. He displaced her from his lap, almost making her sprawl across the blanket as he got up so rapidly. He was clearly frantic, lifting her into his arms and rushing back to the cabin as he listed the steps Dr. Burrow had walked him through during their last appointment. I have to get to the doctor, and I need to get you changed, and— As he continued to ramble, she enjoyed the show, chuckling occasionally. When he had her settled in the bed at their cabin, she lay serenely as she watched him scurry around the room. Finally, he just stopped in the middle of the floor, looking at her in disbelief. Did you just laugh? At her nod, he frowned. Aren't you in pain? She shook her head. Not really. Not yet, I mean. I'm sure I have hours to go. I was just amused by how rattled you are. He frowned at her. Shouldn't you be panicking, or at least concerned? She shook her head. Nope. He walked over to her, seeming to have lost some of his frantic air of panic. But why not? You're about to have a baby. She gave him a smile, allowing her confidence to show in her eyes. I'm not worried because I know you'll take care of me, just like I take care of you. His expression softened, and he paused long enough in his mad preparations to sit down on the bed and lean forward to press a kiss to her forehead. I'll always take care of you. She twined her fingers through his, holding his hand as they shared a quiet moment together before the ensuing chaos really began. I know. She did know, and she was certain he would be there for her. After the last rough few months, she was positive Hale realized she would be there for him, too. They'd come through the worst together, and now they were looking forward to the best. Why would she ever be afraid of that? This has been Fighting for Her Bear, Emerald City Shifters, Book 5. Written by Kit Tunstall, Kit Fox. Narrated by Megan Kelly. Copyright 2016 by Kit Tunstall. Production Copyright 2016 by Kit Tunstall. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.